Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Consider the Cosmos podcast. I'm your co-host, Mary Liz Bender, and I'm so excited to finally bring you this show today. Um, I had an amazing discussion with science rapper Graydon Square, and I think that you will be as inspired by his work as I am. I absolutely love his music, but I also think that you're going to find his personal journey extremely inspiring. So we accidentally had a two and a half hour discussion about music and space travel and sci-fi and theoretical physics and Carl Sagan, and the list goes on. Um, The audio quality is not the best, I apologize. This was the first time I did a Zoom recording and uh, didn't realize that the quality got super compressed. But in the future, I hope to fix that. In addition to my discussion with Graydon, in, in order to help really fill out the story, I also weave in previous interviews that I did with folks. So you're also gonna hear from astronaut Nicole Stott, astronaut Leland Melvin, astronaut Ron Guerin, and you're going to hear from my futurist friends, uh, Rohan Roberts and Jason Silva. Enjoy. Yeah. Type three. Yeah. Started at the foam as a quantum burst. On the journey from the plank through the omniverse. The shortest distance you can travel at the speed of light. Watch me take the same path as the neutrinos flight. Shot forward, zooming past the top cork. Where the space time and energy rose do not fork. I've been slept on since the electron. Westbourne, home of the place to leave your chest warm. Raiden, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. It's so good to have you. It's good to be here. How you doing? I'm doing great. I am doing so great. There's a lot of ground that we need to cover, but I want to start by just having people understand who you are and where you're at in this time and space right now. How do you typically introduce yourself to folks? Well, first of all, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege and, and I'm, I'm grateful to be on your show. I don't necessarily know if I get to introduce myself in that way a lot of times because a lot of people have had me in their minds as the atheist rapper for so long. And I feel like I've moved so far away from that at this point. Um, I'm always willing to talk about that issue and I don't necessarily think that those, though that worldview has changed about reality. However, the things that I talk about is not related really to atheism or secularism at all. Mm -hmm. It's very much more related to science and technology and space travel and the Kardashev scale and, you know, uh, a lot of these these topics that aren't really mainstream, but a lot of people are interested in. There's a whole demographic of people who really just want the brain picked and their noodle scrambled, if you will. Uh, they like that intellectual stimulation, that dopamine rush when you when you present to them a concept in a way where it makes their brain run. It makes their mind go into places that some of the great thinkers and philosophers have gone. So I like to introduce myself as, you know, Graydon Square, founder of Grand Unified. Uh, Mm -hmm. And yeah, if you want to call me an atheist rapper, that's fine. I've been known as a lot of different things, science rapper, nerd core, a lot of different things, but I'm an MC, you know, I like just being an MC. At this stage in my career as more of a teacher, I've taken on more of a, an instructor role with mm. rap and music. Oh, I so didn't I have, that. thank you. Well, it's, it's, it's a lot harder than it sounds. And I feel like I'm at a point now where if I can't teach it, I don't know it well enough. Mm, that's, yeah, that's always like the good rule of thumb, right? I was a programmer for well over a decade. And anytime I came up to an issue, I would say, let me just try to teach this to someone else. Or, I, you know, you might know it as rubber ducking. Like you sit a mm-hmm. rubber duck on your desk and you try to explain to them, well, this is how I'm doing it and this is why. And if you walk it through to a certain point and you get stuck, therein lies the issue, right? So, What, what languages did you uh, program? PHP, um, processing, but I did a lot of front-end development prior okay. to that. Ruby, Ruby on Rails was my favorite framework to work in. I went through 
uh, I coded a little bit. I'm not even oh. going to say I, 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 you know, anything like that, but I got, I went through a Python phase oh, cool. where, yeah, I was, you know, coding little games, snake, the snake game and, um, nice. you know, uh, tic-tac-toe and a bunch of different hangman. Um, and I was going through tutorials and stuff like that, just because I've always been interested in uh, computer programming and code in general, like beautiful code, you know it when you see it, regardless yes. of if you can code or not. Uh, and I've always been interested in that. So I always, every now and then I'll, I'll, I'll try my hand at coding or we have a whole community within our community of coders and people I know. who just kind of get into just coding. And so. But let's, okay. So first of all, I want to talk about your community because I have just joined it. And I got to say that I am part of several discord communities. I, I myself run communities and I've never seen a group of people exactly like the folks you have somehow put together. They are some of the most empathetic and thoughtful thinkers. I mean, extremely logical, but never trying to immediately knee jerk, have a reaction to anything. They're so thoughtful to everything. And, and I feel like I've found a lot of people like that in these other Discord communities, but by far, your community is really special and extremely supportive. So why, why don't you talk about how you came to bring these people together and, and how do you work with them? Well, I'm sure that's the nicest, that's probably the nicest compliment that I've ever heard about the GU community. And I will say the GU community because it's actually... Uh, a bunch of smaller communities that exist under the same banner. So mm -hmm. there was an idea, and I hate to sound like Nick Fury, but there was an idea in at, at a, a point in about 2008, 2009, when a lot of us, quote unquote, atheist rappers or secular rappers, we were all kind of doing our own thing independently. And on the internet, you could, you would find people, for instance, uh, Tombstone the Dead Man, one of you know the other founders of, of Grand Unified. You know, people would try to pit us against each other, like, "Oh, you're not better than this guy, and he's he's iller than you, or whatever." And and one day, I reached out to him, and I was like, uh, "Hey, man, I mean, I know we don't know each other, but here, check out this comment section on Reddit that was talking about us." And I sent it to him, and he laughed about it, and we met each other. Well, he had already had his own community. Like the Reaper Legion was its own thing before Grand Unified had even kind of coagulated into a kind of multi-house sort of thing. And so he had already had his community. And then, you know, guys like Sickness and Seagats and Johnny Hoax, they already had their own community on that side. And then Low Technology was born later and the Giannis Leth was one of the original houses. And you know, the trans intellectuals were the, the Facebook group community that had, you know, 2000 members in it and whatnot. And so it was bringing all of these people together under one banner. And it wasn't really until Discord, we could really do that. Mm -hmm. Discord doesn't get enough credit because I know a lot of people <laughs> like to hate on Discord and sometimes for good reason. It's a bit bloated. Uh, but Discord has done something that I haven't seen since IRC. I don't know if you remember IRC. But IRC yeah. chat. Remember IRC yeah, chat? Yeah, yeah, long. Yeah. But I, I feel like my phase with that was short. Yeah, well, maybe AOL chat was was kind of the same thing yeah. because it had uh, it also had groups, yeah. right? So you could kind of talk about certain things. I was just well, saying that Discord reminds me of <laughs> AOL chat rooms. <laughs> anyway, it dates us. Know. It absolutely dates us for sure. Mm -hmm. um, there, is a, there is an element of community that people long for. And when you're a thinker, it's harder for you to find that than it would be just for a kind of a person who's not really in their thoughts like that. So what I tried to do was I tried to create a Discord community where people clearly knew who was not only in quote unquote charge, but who could kind of set the direction and the tone for the community. Because my thing is tone and delivery is everything when you communicate. Mm -hmm. If you're communicating with somebody, I can say, you know, uh, hey, Mary Liz, you know, uh, maybe we could do something different w with X or Y. And, and you'd be like, OK, well, that, that's cool. I'll think about that. But if I'm, I came at you and I'm like, you know what? This really sucks. You know, why don't you just do it this way? I'm saying the same thing, really. Mm -hmm. But 
if I'm able to communicate with a better delivery and a better tone, it may be more likely that you would be, you know, amenable to, to the suggestions that I'm trying to make. And so I always try to set this tone of being uh, considerate and empathetic while also holding your ground. I don't want you to just, you know, be a pushover and no, cause we foster debate here. You've seen probably a lot of it. There's a mm-hmm. lot of, you know, discourse when it comes to politics or, you know, even food. I mean, the food channel is, people talk <laughs> about so much food, the food channel. Um, but, but I always tried to make this environment one that the tone and the, and the delivery fostered discourse. It fostered communication. Mm-hmm. So people didn't feel like, hey, if I brought this topic up, I'm going to get attacked for it. Mm-hmm. If I bring up this alternate perspective. I'm not going to be called a racist here. I'm not Mm -hmm. going to be called a transphobe here or a a misogynist because I I had a question about something or I thought a different way or, you know, uh, to me, there are very few places, and I hate to use this term, but safe spaces for open discourse these days. Now, I feel like you have to have this sterilized, hive mind approved dialogue where the narrative is already set you're told what your talking points are and if you stray from that in any kind of way you're castigated you're ostracized you're you're out you know canceled yeah you're canceled you're You're that's it yeah i've been actually talking about this a lot i mean especially with recent events it feels like um people are just having a really hard time being human you know and so and we're having a hard time being truthful with each other and being open and i'm it's sad because i see this as a time to really come together i see this as a time to unite and grow and you can't do that if you're not talking which is why i really i've loved your community because it's true that you lead by example i see that and nobody is really afraid. And even I've seen people like kind of shy away from their point and say, oh, sorry, sorry. And then other people were like, no, 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 don't worry. Like you can defend yourself. You can, it's okay. We're not judging you. You don't go away now. You even called that person out. It was during a, a, one of your live streams, which are just absolutely amazing. So you've mentioned two things now that I think are really missing from society today. And I think it's something that I've been trying to work on, but I feel like you have somehow just really mastered bringing this to people. And this is why they've come to you. Um, So the one is, of course, this ability to have open, logical discussions. And the other is you challenge people intellectually. You don't shy away and you don't try to, you know, kind of baby them. Like it, it feels like the whole world, you know, bought into the keep it simple, stupid mantra. And I kind of feel like I've seen the degrading of <laughs> society or at least open conversations as a result of that. And um, you and I have a, a hero in common or at least someone that has really inspired us. Hold on. Can um, I guess what it is? Go for it. Uh, okay. So... I, people know who I have. I have two main huge heroes, and I'm not sure if you're a fan of one. Oh. It's not Fela, so it has to be Carl Sagan. Uh, I love Fela Kuti, if that's what you're talking about. That's what I'm talking oh about. Oh, my that's God. Actually what, he's like my favorite musician of all time. <laughs> I love Fela Kuti. I, okay, so we'll talk about that in a second. I was talking about Carl because I didn't know that you knew about Fela. I just talked about Fela Kuti this morning to my bandmate because um, – you know, he made protest music. Yes. That was happy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was like You joyous. could dance to it. Yeah, it was joyous. It was joyous protest. It was, uh, and I don't mean to cut you off, but it, Fela is somebody who, I remember my first Fela experience. Everyone, you, you remember your first Fela experience, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, I was already a musician and I was already known when I had had this experience, right? So it's probably like 2008, 2009. I hadn't created the Cartage of Scale yet but I had already put out two albums and I walk into this record shop and something is playing. And I'm a person, look, I have super huge ears. I'm sure you, you know, I have really big ears. Right. (laughs) And so sounds from everywhere in all corners and all angles are going to hit these big lobes. I got ears like Ferengi. So my Ferengi ears pick up this sound, this, this Afro beat. It's a, it's magnetic. It's, it's got, 
gravity to it. It pulls you and you're like, what is that? What, who is playing this? What is this? Can I just buy all the records that sound like this? And the guy's like, yeah, man, it's the last one. And I was like, how much? He was like, I don't even care. Just give it to me. I think I paid $25. And that was the first time I had realized that anyone could do a 21 minute song. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yep. Fela wow. is a guy who I aspire to be like in a lot of ways. And I know like most human beings, he had, he had his character flaws and stuff like that. But as, an, as a force, as a creative force of humanity, he is one of the best who has ever existed. He's like Bob Marley and Tupac rolled into one. Yes. Like, there's no one like him, in my opinion. There were, people talk to me about like, you know, Bob Marley and, and Tupac. And no shade to those guys, right? Those are p- very transcendental figures in their own. But Fela, Fela spawned a, not only a continent, but he created a whole style of music, basically a whole subgenre of a style of music that really didn't exist before him. Uh, there's, he, I can't praise him enough. Do, have you seen his documentary? Music yeah. is the Weapon? Yeah. It's my it's top three, top four documentary for me. It, it's, so, so there are a couple. There are like two documentaries that I always recommend to people. One is Nina Simone's Live in Montreux, or however it said, mm-hmm. a jazz festival from, I think it was 67. Mm-hmm. 76 I always get it wrong and the other is is Fela Kuti because that was my introduction to him and his music and what was the documentary what's that you said was the documentary was the, yeah. the, 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 okay wow that's powerful so I saw the documentary and I was blown away because I you know I wrote a lot of political songs and um you know I thought of myself as an activist as a teenager <laughs> And I was like a hardcore punk rocker, you know, and then I watched the Fela Kuti documentary and I'm like, oh, th- I see. I get it now. So this is how you can really create change. Well, one thing I will say is first, I would love to dive into some of your your music at some point off air. I think it'd be fascinating just to trade notes as musicians. Sure. but. Um, when it comes to protest music and using your voice as a, as a force for change and stuff like that, look, we would all live in the shadow of people like Marley and Tupac and, and mm-hmm. Faye Lacuti, right? Yeah. Uh, but I don't want people to feel like just because you aren't that, uh, you know, big of an artist that you can't, your voice can't be heard in a creative way. Mm-hmm. You may not be the greatest musician. You may not be the greatest rapper, or the greatest producer, but what you do matters in a chorus of voices that are trying to better the human condition. And I feel like you should always, because when I wasn't that good, I was still writing music that I felt like was socially forceful or impactful or whatever the word I'm looking for. It sought to induce change. Mm -hmm. And if, if I didn't believe that I could do that, even at my, you know, lessened skill level, um, I don't know where I'd be today. I I totally agree with you. The process of the creative process is so hard, especially when you are a thinker, because you get so deep inside your head and you can, you can question it to a point where you never get anywhere, which is something that I I work through a lot. But, but I think with Fela, what happened was I realized that you could use beauty, you know, like you could use joy and dancing as a way to kind of induce a state of awe and wonder where you're more open, you know? Um, I don't know if, if people are that open, though. I think a lot of people are closed systems when it comes. And I, I speak for myself, right? Mm-hmm. I, I am a very closed creative system. And I, I get into a lot of trouble from people who want me to check out certain music and new music from this place and that because it's like there are certain things I'm just not going to listen to. Now, my reasoning for that I feel like should be understood and understandable yeah. as a as a reason, but there are people who simply don't understand why I don't do that. Having said that, uh, you know, Tombstone said something in a conversation we had on the podcast what I thought was really important. Uh, you can be a closed system to protect the integrity of what you have, but if you are a closed system, then no new information gets in and thus no new novelty can be created. And I do feel like there's truth to that. So. You know, I think 
someone like me who's a hardliner when it comes to to what I listen to, maybe I should be a little bit more open. Um, you know, when it comes to people like Fela who show people that you can you can be beautiful and and your political message can not only sound good and 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 sow uh, seeds of dissent in the political sense, but it can bring people together and create an atmosphere of joy, which I feel like we've gotten away from with our art. I am totally with you. That's what always strikes me when I listen to Fela. And actually, um, I think I watched the documentary because I was about to play a music festival where his son was performing. Mm-hmm. Femi, right? Yeah, Femi. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh well, he's my. got he's got he's got sons like Marley, so we never know at this point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's so true. But, uh, and I think the documentary covers that aspect of his life. Um, But Femi was amazing. I mean, his band was incredible and the dancers blew me away. That was like a true moment of awe and wonder for me. There's there's this song, I think it's called Joy, um, but it's like the only thing that I can hear when I think of this song. Mm -hmm. He just like dances around and everybody's going insane. And, you know, there's like this crazy hand drum solo for a thousand years. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, like they're building up, they're building up, they're building up. And the whole song is like evil people everywhere. He's just singing evil people everywhere. And then eventually this crescendo comes and then everything stops. And he says, but they will never, never, never no true joy and then he like goes insane (laughs) it just really hit me that um that's a really powerful thing to say you know when you kind of when you go through the kind of things that his family went through surely so anyway uh to everyone listening i highly recommend checking out fela kuti one of the best musicians of all time music is the weapon is the uh is the the documentary if you're interested in what we're actually talking about thank you yeah and then the other thing that i was saying that you've brought into the world is is that intellectual um side to your art which is really the signature of your art and that's something that carl sagan always brought into the world so you you mentioned carl sagan quite a bit in your music which i think is really amazing where did you discover him and what first drew you to that world? So it's interesting. I had a weird introduction to Carl Sagan because I discovered Carl Sagan through rap. And I know a lot of people are like, well, hmm, how did you do that? So my Sifu, my teacher, the person that I learned hip hop from directly and indirectly from was a rapper by the name of Cannabis. He's an all time great. He was easily one of the greatest among his class in, in the late 90s. And he had a a line where he mentioned Carl Sagan. And he also had mentioned something along with the Drake equation. So those were two things, two concepts that I had learned from a rapper. And when the internet was kind of coming about, I was able to kind of look some of these concepts up, look up who Carl Sagan was. And this was way before Wikipedia or anything like that. Mm So, you know, this was in the early days, days of the internet where it was the wild west. You could post anything and it was just there. Those those Um, were the good old days. (laughs) Those were the good old days. I will say that it is a totally different. I will say that if you're of an age today where you don't remember that time, there's a whole different internet that used to be, uh, but it's, it's no longer that. So I had heard about Carl Sagan through that, but then, uh, I had, discovered the Cosmos series shortly after that and started catching up on a lot of his Cosmos material where he started talking about, you know, four dimensional objects and 4D space and, um, you know, Flatlanders and all these different concepts. And he was one of the, I mean, I, so I I came up with this thing called trans intellectualism a long time ago. And I always talk about him being the first trans intellectual. What what is the Uh, definition for you? A trans intellectual is, okay, so it's related to the Kardashev scale. So that to put it in the type of framing and context, I think it's better that we start off with what the Kardashev scale is. And mm-hmm. so there was a Russian physicist named Nikolai Kardashev who came up with this way of measuring advanced civilizations, right? Planetary, stellar, um, you know, interstellar, g- galactic, intergalactic, right? Like he had this way of 
measuring how advanced these these uh, civilizations were by, among other things, their energy consumption and output, their ability uh, to control their their kind of physical destiny. If there were a planetary species, then there wouldn't be any type of planetary event that could render them extinct. Or if they were a, a stellar species or an interstellar species, it just expands in scope. And so I, I became fascinated with this idea around 2008, 2009. And I was already coming off of my second album, which was primarily about atheism called the CPT theorem. And I was looking for, I was at a crossroads in life and I was looking for a, a new way, a way to reinvent myself. And so nobody had ever talked about this. Even my favorite rapper of all time, Cannabis, had never talked about anything like this. And that's no, no shade on him because he had talked about some pretty advanced topics as well. But I felt like, well, I could literally make a whole album out of this. I didn't think I could make a whole career out of it, right? <laughs> uh, so I had uh, basically re, I threw away a lot of that material I was working on for my third album that ended up became that ended up becoming the Carter Shift Scale. But a lot of that stuff ended up staying. The, 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 the misconception about the Carter Shift Scale was that it wasn't about atheism. And it was probably my most atheistic album because mm -hmm. I had all this material that I had written for the next version of what was going to be the CPT, which was going to be Compton scattering, which is a whole different other thing. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, to, I go back to, to say that uh, the Carter's scale was used to invent the concept of the trans intellectual and the trans intellectual was someone who wanted to use their creativity or their into, into their intellect to propel humanity up the Carter's scale mm. to increase humanity's mobility up the scale. So if you work with SpaceX or you, you teach science education, you teach STEM, um, you're into programs that allow uh, demographics that may not have the access that other demographics do uh, to, to science and, and, and uh, education and mathematics and engineering and, and all those different things. And so um, with the trans intellectual, it became a way to describe people who were about propelling human, humanity towards type one. And then obviously when we get to type one, hopefully humanity will take over for us and push us towards type two. So that's what the trans intellectual term came from. It came from the idea of the Kardashev scale by Nikolai Kardashev. And we just kind of acknowledge that, Car that Carl Sagan was the first of us. Got it. Uh, thank you. Because I had been wondering, I've been hanging out in the Discord channel and I'm like, and listening to some of the songs and I'm like, trans intellectualism, this sounds really exciting. <laughs> I don't know what it means yet, but I am definitely hip to the type one, two, three civilizations. And um, in one of your, I was trying to decide where do I subscribe? Patreon, Bandcamp. So I was trying to make the decision. I was reading some things and you, you said that something like you cover a range of topics anywhere from atheism to type three entities. And I was like, all right, I think I know what's going on here. <laughs> But anyway, um, before, before we get too far there, mm -hmm. I want to talk about um, how long you've been making music. It's been, what, since 2004? Was that right? There. Okay. So there's two answers to this because you, it's almost like being an amateur athlete. Uh, you know, there was a time you were doing it and you were an amateur. And then when you go pro, you, that's the day you really count it. Mm -hmm. So... I released my first album, officially my first album, the one that's not called The Confident Effects, called Absolute in 2005-ish, four or five. When I got out of the military, I put that album out. And it was an album that I literally would stand at the gas station and ask people if I could play it in their car. And I would ask if I could, you know, basically trade the change in their car for a burnt CD of my music on it. Wow. And I, yeah, I met a lot of people like that too. It's actually pretty crazy. Um, but it was uh, to even go back then, but that wasn't when I became, cause I was still operating under the name Apocalypse back then. I hadn't even changed my name yet. And then I, I came out to Phoenix uh, to go to school. I, I was, you know, going to school for physics and, and then decided to go for, you know, well, actually I went out here for sound engineering and then decided to go for physics. Uh, and in that transition, um, I had changed my name to Graydon Square. 
So in 2006 ish, I changed my name to Graydon Square from Apocalypse. And that's when I kind of count when it began because then I put out my first album in 2007. The problem with that though, is that a lot of the material from the 2007 album was predated when I changed my name. So songs like Roots and, you know, x and, uh, you know, there's a lot of songs on there that are just, that predate the name Graydon Square that I just had left over. And then I wrote like three or four more new songs and that album became that album. I didn't know it was gonna be successful. I didn't know that people were gonna listen to it. I didn't know that anybody was gonna care about what I was doing. Uh, but a few people who had the ability to influence, you know, whatever they had the ability to influence had brought me up in the, in certain circles. And there were people who were interested in what I was doing and somebody had reached out. So I'd say the official answer to that question, I know it's a very roundabout way of answering it, but 2006, you know, I've been making music though, since I was six or seven, I've been playing the piano since I was six or seven. I sung in the choir when I was five. Um, so music has always been a part of my life. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's always been a part of me. I learned to play the piano. I taught myself to play the piano when I was six as well. And yeah, I'm a self-taught piano player as well. I knew that. And I, I want to know when you sit down at like a piano and I'm not mm -hmm. talking about a keyboard like that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you feel something different do you feel like you've come back home or something yeah but I, I get that feeling in a couple of ways so piano yes but I also get it when I write to beats like mm -hmm. when I am able to rhyme and you know we call it landing when you're able to land it's a, it's a different feeling. It's a different dopamine rush. You feel like your entire existence was meant to do this very thing. Mm -hmm. And I think most people who do things very well get that feeling. So I don't think that that is unique, but um, I do get a feeling. There is a, a uniqueness when you sit down at the piano or when you sing in a group of people a cappella. There's a mm -hmm. primal type of, I don't know, is, is, is a primal feeling or an ancient feeling. It's almost like I tell people, you know, people are like, why is baseball popular? It's so slow. And I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> baseball is a glimpse into 120 years ago. Hmm. It's the oldest game from the past that the Western world has. If you're looking at baseball, it's, it's a glimpse into the past. And whenever, any, anytime somebody asks me about like, well, why is baseball popular? And I think that's the same thing when you uh, sing in a choir or you sit down at the piano or you do anything that's of an like, ancient form of creativity. So I do think that that has a lot to do with it. You have this amazing um, routine that you do that I've only just discovered, and I want to know about it. So mm -hmm. you, it's a, an extremely vulnerable thing to do. I don't think I could do it. You live stream yourself and you invite your community and you put in the topic like something probably controversial that you want to just like get people talking about. And there's this period of time where you're playing your own beats and sometimes you're like, this is a writing session mm -hmm. and you'll mute, but everybody will be there. We're all looking at you. <laughs> We're all mm -hmm. chatting with one another and you're moving your lips. And then you'll come back and say, oh, when I'm, I'm just writing right now. Like I'm literally just riffing. <laughs> I was like, what, how can you write in the open like that? How, does, what is the process like for you? It gets even crazier because I not only try to write in front of people, but I also try to write in front of my students and encourage my students to write in front of people as well. Wow. Because if you can write in front of somebody, then, you know, rapping in front of somebody isn't going to be hard at all. Uh, and I try to shock the stage fright out of all of my students very early. Like it's like boot camp. You know, it's it's very hard because no fan is going to be harder on you than I'm going to be. There's no listener who's going to be harder on you about the expectations of what I what what is expected of you through your creativity than I'm going to be. So my students kind of realize that like you can be afraid of them or you can be afraid of me, you know? And, and, and I mean that in the most kindest and respectful way, because I'm trying to get the best out of them. 
the fan or the listener, they're just trying to listen and be entertained. So we're working from two different places here. Uh, when I talk, me and RK Gold, uh, my co-host for my podcast, we talk about this all the time. I never wanted to be the quote unquote greatest, even though you desire that when you're in your prime, you're like, you know, you just think to yourself, like, I want to be the best at this, but I wanted to create the greatest or create versions of the greatest. I wanted to be the master it to a Bruce Lee. I really didn't care about being Bruce Lee himself. Now, mm -hmm. Bruce Lee is an iconic figure, but I think it's more fascinating the processes that went into making a Bruce Lee as opposed to just Bruce Lee being Bruce Lee and having the impact that he did. You know, what makes the Felas? Mm. I want to be a part of that. And so that's why I kind of got into more of a teaching role as I settled into my place in history and hip hop history, uh, what I've done. I, I think I have a pretty successful and, and, and established legacy. I'd like to think that I do, but who knows? I agree that you have already left your mark and you've, you know, probably hardly begun. Let me every... ask you this question. I'm, I'm sorry. Let me ask you this question. Are you normally a fan of rap at all? I wouldn't say that I have like an amazing selection and I listen all the time, but mm -hmm. you know, I grew up in the nineties loving hip hop. And then I, I went through different hip hop phases, but I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't heard any new hip hop that really excited me lately. And so when I heard it, I was like, oh my God, I feel it almost felt like a coming back home to something that I really love, but it's so intellectual and um, obviously was hitting all of my favorite topics. I literally went through like all the playlists and I highlighted all of these lines that stuck out to me. And Oh yeah, you got some lines you want to discuss? I'm all down for that. Yeah, every MC is a poet. Let's, there, there are two references that you make to poets that obviously really speak to me. Mm -hmm. One of them is every MC is a poet. And I was listening to your um, Gray and Gold podcast, and there was an episode where you talk about the creative process. And, and you talk about referring to rappers as poets. And I, first, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah. Uh, it's, first, it's a, it's a very strange feeling for lyric, my lyrics to be parsed in that way. Um, <laughs> just It's a surreal feeling. But I do think that an MC or a rapper is the evolutionary next step of the poet. You're just taking poetry and you're adding a little bit more rules to it. You're saying, mm -hmm. okay, here's the structure, um, the expectation that you're going to either soft rhyme or hard rhyme these words, these syllables, there's a syllable count, uh, stanzas, schemes, there's, there's wordplay in the same way there's going to be wordplay in poets or in poetry. And some of the greatest poets, in my opinion, if you were to just look at their lines, they read like lyrics, they read like rhymes, like rap lyrics. And so, uh, shout out to RK Gold for even bringing that conversation out of me like that. I mean, he's such a fantastic co-host. Uh, it, there is an element that poetry plays in hip hop if you're looking at it from the perspective of being a poet and having the responsibility of a poet. But I don't think a lot of rappers of today are looking at hip hop as that and they're not looking at the art as they have a responsibility as poets to, you know, evolve poetry into its next evolutionary step, whatever that is. Uh, I think they're looking at it as a means to an end. So. When I say, you know, rappers, when I make references to rappers being poets, I'm, I'm really referring to the ones that look past the immediate uh, gratification of what can hip hop do for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the ones who are kind of giving to the legacy of hip hop and trying to in validate the credibility of it being a, a poetry art form. Yeah. It, it really, it's intriguing. I actually, um, you know, I've been writing music and lyrics for almost my whole life, but I only recently got into poetry, like literally the quarantine. And so every morning, Interesting. I was, <laughs> very strange. So every morning I went out um, and I would watch the sunrise and I would write a little poetry based on my, how I was feeling or my experience or whatever. 
And now I've got, I almost daily, I did that. So <laughs> I have racked up quite a few poems, but I realized how sloppy I've always been with my writing. And when I heard you sing that line and then have that discussion in the podcast, I was thinking about it. And I was like, you know, I, um, I'm really amazed because I just feel like watching you on the fly come up with these crazy structures. I mean, this is some of the best poetry that I've come across. And for me, it's like, oh, I've, you know, it takes some time, you know, and then I rearrange stuff and I scribble it out and whatever. So I'm, I'm pretty amazed by that. And then the second line I actually emailed you about, it's what really has drawn us together, I think. Um, now, you're probably referring to uh, the movie Contact. I'm going to guess that sci-fi, as far as sci-fi is concerned, Contact might be one of your inspirations. It is, my, it is a primary inspiration of my entire life. Like wow. It is, it is that Star Trek, uh, Princess Bride belongs to that conversation, The Goonies, The Wizard, uh, yeah, those are foundational pillars of my life. And Contact as a movie changed my life probably more so than anything, other than Star Trek. I think Star Trek Deep Space Nine sits a little bit above Contact as far as influential uh, wow. in my life, yeah. Wow. Well, I, I almost want to just like pause and, and go there. What about <sighs> Contact? How did you discover it and where did it take Oof. you? Okay, so Contact came out in 95, right? I was living in Compton at the time. And I remember it was a movie that I was taken to see because um, I was in this group home. And uh, I actually, we actually got a chance to, it was one of those things where they just drop you off at the theater and we're like, hey, we're going to come pick you guys back up. It was back in those days. They just drop wow. you off. We'll be back. And we, I was like uh, 14 maybe. And I, I, you basically see 14 year olds hanging out by themselves. So it's not too crazy, but this is LA, you know, <laughs> we're out at, at whatever theater we were at out in Carson or whatever. And I remember everybody else went to go see something. I don't even know what it was. And I just, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go see this contact. And I remember the movie, you know, cause it ran long. People didn't believe me that I went and saw that. They thought I had like went out somewhere and went to the store or somewhere around the corner. I was like, no, I was still in the movie. They didn't even believe that the movie was that long and that it was, you know. So, yeah, that was when I had, I had first saw Contact the movie. And then I had, when it came out on video a couple of, maybe about a year later, back in that time, it took about a year for things to make it to video. Mm -hmm. um, I had somehow I had gotten it on VHS and I watched it over and over wow. and over. You know, um, it was probably top five watched movie by me ever. And I'm putting that in the conversation with like the Goonies, Princess Bride, Star <laughs> Trek Generations, like. Princess Bride, I was just talking about Princess Bride. I really need to watch that again. Um, so that, you, is, that is the greatest movie ever created. It, you do realize it, that, right? I, I think it might be. It's definitely up there. I, I struggle. I feel like I'm, I'm now like, what is the best one? I feel like there is another one that I think is the best, but. Well, I've heard really Shawshank Redemption. I've heard, uh, you know, Gone with the Wind. You hear Casablanca, but it, like, I feel like, look, I'm not going to, it's like talking about Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle. I'm sure they were great. I'm sure they were great. I'm sure they were great. I'm sure Will Chamberlain was fantastic, <laughs> but in the modern age, the princess bride is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was the GOAT, end of discussion. But <laughs> I, I feel like all the Jordan fans are like, what? Uh, no, Contact as a movie, I feel like any young child who's 13, 14, 15 years old, you're going to come away from that movie wondering about things, about life, mm. about life out there. Oh, I'm sorry. I know what the best movie is to me, mm -hmm. from my perspective. And it's the movie that did that for me. Cause I actually didn't discover contact until I was an adult. Okay. That's a longer story, but it was 2001, a space odyssey, which I saw when I was 14. That's not yeah. a bad, that's not a bad suggestion. It's my favorite movie. It's my favorite book and they go together. And I love that. I love that they were written together to be a unit, but 
but yeah, Princess Bride contact definitely up in that. Hey, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that 2001 Space Odyssey was written as a book and a movie to be experienced yes. together. One thing I know about 2001 Space Odyssey was that score, oh. the music is incredible. So it's one good. of the best scores ever, and no one ever gives it that type of credit. Oh, I do. I, yeah. I never, I never stop talking about that. That waltz when during weightlessness, it's mm -hmm. like it's insane. Um, yeah, that's the thing about 2001 is that people always come away saying, I don't even know what happened. And first of all, I'm like, how is that not the most exciting part? <laughs> and the other part of me says, you have to read the book because mm -hmm. they're really meant to be consumed in parallel. Um, so yeah, I, I highly recommend it. Arthur C. Clarke wrote the book and one of the all time greats. Absolutely amazing. So Getting back to contact, though, mm -hmm. um, you use a line in another one of your songs, mm -hmm. that w which is, damn, we should have sent a poet. Yeah, that's a direct reference to contact. I figured it was. Mm -hmm. Well, what's, what's interesting is that I had forgotten that that was part of contact because it's so present in my mind that I guess this is where Carl Sagan got it. Um, in 1968, Frank Borman, one of the Apollo astronauts, he was one of the Apollo 8 astronauts that took mm. that Earthrise image. He came back from lunar orbit, you know, totally changed. And someone asked him, how would you describe your experience? And his response was, we should have sent poets. Mm -hmm. He literally couldn't describe it. He was like, we're, we're engineers, like we're test pilots. You guys should have sent poets because we cannot describe the grandeur of what we saw. And that's affected me. And that's what brought me to you. Think, <laughs> think oh, wow, well, well, that, well, that's crazy. But think about what he's saying in that. He's mm -hmm. saying that I have the technical expertise to pilot a craft into space, defying all of the, the common laws that we understand about our world. Uh, and yet I don't even have the ability to articulate the majesty and the beauty of what I saw. And I feel like this is where I get into places where I talk about reality in such a grand scale, the omniverse, you know, a lot of different things like that. Because at a certain scale, it's just relationships. And I'd like to think that there's a beauty to those expressions if you see them at a, at a high enough scale. That reality is beautiful. Mm -hmm. What is, is beautiful. And then we get into this other philosophical conversation, which is why is there something rather than nothing, which is a question that I've struggled with my entire life. Well, I hope you never stop struggling <laughs> with that. That's, that's it. That's the struggle. That's humanity. That's the whole point, right? Yeah. Um, he, was it him? Someone, someone else said, you know, we went out there to discover the moon but what we discovered was ourselves. And, you know, those were in the early days of Apollo when only a handful of people, like 10, 15 people had gone total. Mm. And they come back and they're all saying the same thing. Like, I don't know how to describe what happened. Um, there's another lyric in, I think the same song, which in which you say, you basically do a cosmic zoom or, or what, people refer to as the power of 10 zoom out, right? I think that's even in your Omniverse video, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yep, you know, absolutely. That yep. And you say something like, you know, we're a couple parsecs out or something, mm -hmm. and, you, and you mention the overview. Mm -hmm. Can you recite that line? So uh, let me pull that up because that, that is a, let's see, that's a pretty good line that, to, to talk about because a lot of people – forget or not forget but they misunderstand what my purpose is uh as, a, as an MC, and i say that because it's it's one of those things that i have to clarify which is my goal was never to be a famous rapper to people who were just fans of rap it was never that my goal was always to be an a, a rap option for people who wanted intellectual stimulation because that's what I wanted with my rap. Uh, I never did music to, to, to quote unquote, make money so much as it, 
it was to kind of place myself in history amongst the great thinkers of all time. Hmm. So the line I was talking about, um, where we're talking about different parsecs, and I mean, I used a lot of stuff in this. It's, it's, I can't believe how, how many words you pack into this. <laughs> it's beautiful. So I said, um, who you talking to? I spit the cold vision. Visit every world near to leave the solar system. Only one of many. All the space in between here and there is cold and much of it is empty. Still come across a nebula or two, a couple of parsecs, and we've only gone a few. The void we launch into from Orion's arm. Starships, galaxy class, we flying on. Galactic following, barely known in a local group. Training all alone, their large voids evoking truth. Take it in, let it sober you. As we go out to get a better seat of the overview, an ocean of space engulfing you with so many super clusters, the singular remote. I mean, these are some of my favorite lyrics I've ever heard. And, you know, a lot of people try to make sciencey music, mm -hmm. but this, this feels organic. This doesn't feel forced. It feels like it, it goes beyond you know, just like trying to talk about science for the sake of talking about science. This is a philosophy that you're getting into. And it's literally like, I, I've been talking for a couple of years now since I co-founded my organization, Cosmic Perspective. And the whole point was to take the grand concepts of the Cosmic Perspective and bring it down into these practical lessons that can be useful to us humans, these tiny little humanoids right here on earth, right? And I feel like you accomplish that in each verse of each song. And it's, it's pretty amazing. But I think it's maybe a couple lines before the Parsec line where you say something like from this, from here, we get a good overview or something mm -hmm. that, make, that made me wonder mm -hmm. if you'd ever heard of the overview effect. I don't think I have, but I'd love to hear it right now. Oh my God. I'm so excited to tell you about my favorite subject in the universe. Okay. I'm with it. <laughs> All right. This is, this is straight space philosophy. Um, it's all about perspective and, and, you know, we've already really covered it. It's just that someone gave a name to it and he's a mm. wonderful human named Frank White. So in the 1960s, like I was saying, the Apollo astronauts came back and they said, we should have sent poets. I can't explain my experience. And, and one of those astronauts, Edgar Mitchell, actually like went on a whole mission, like, tell me what I experienced. I don't understand how to explain it. Like he, he literally could not stop until someone gave him the language he needed to explain this experience. Whoa. It, it was really intense. He went to, he said, I went to all the religious texts. I went to all the philosophical texts. I couldn't find it. I, I went to a university and I eventually found this, uh, this word, which was some ancient word that I wish I, I remembered right now. But it was basically an awakening. It was an ecstasy moment that he had where he was like, oh, I get it. I get it. We're all part of this universe. And... There. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you, go for it. Yeah, yeah, well, so there's, man, there's so much to talk about with this because I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to incriminate myself here, but uh, there's a lot of people out there, excuse me, there's a lot of people out there who have had psychedelic experiences, and this is a part of the description that they come away with, which is, I do not have the vocabulary to describe what I experienced. There are no words. And I think when you talk about the human, when you talk about the human experience at the lowest scale or the universe at the highest scale, there really aren't words that we have to describe those things. Because in my opinion, they predate the human experience, whatever that experience is. Um, psychedelics when you're able to see the planet if you're able to leave the planet i don't know there's probably been how many people have left the planet ever in history like a hundred no 570 about mm -hmm. that's crazy <laughs> that, in human history that's all think about that for mm -hmm. people who are listening in the in the history of humanity 500 and some odd people you know there's only 420 people who play in the nba 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> no, I so didn't. It's like, you know, you're talking about the, the, the top, top slice of, you know, the, the human lottery winner to be able to do that. But mm -hmm. um, I feel like there's a lot of people who have that experience. I, I hope to have that experience uh, at some point in my life. I, I think I've kind of had a little bit of it with some of the things that the topics that I talk about, but I feel like there's an upper limit to understanding. Um, and I'm not sure that I, I, I'm not sure I can break through that upper limit. I'm not sure anybody can. Mm. Yeah, it, you're right that a lot of people make that comparison, by the way, with the, the, the psychedelic experience and this. Although I've talked to Frank White about that. Um, Frank White is a space historian, a space philosopher, and he coined the term the overview effect. This wasn't until 1987, he published the book. And what he did was um, he didn't know about Edgar Mitchell and he didn't know about those folks coming back and, and um, you know, trying to put language to something. He was actually just on a flight where he went from Washington, D.C. and I think he went over Las Vegas or something. He did a cross-country flight. And while he was looking down at the earth, he was like, wow, I just left all of the petty politics of D.C. There's gone. There's behind me. They look so tiny from up here. And he was, you know, thinking, well, now I'm already over here. I wonder what this has to be like for space settlers. And he was thinking, you know, when, when people are, when humans are on other worlds and they look at our planet, that's got to have some kind of like profound, long lasting perspective shift that changes them and changes the way that they think. And imagine then coming back to those humans with that perspective and them all looking at you like you're a crazy person because you have that new perspective. They're going to say, no, no, it's all in your head or no, no, stop thinking with your heart. Stop being so emotional, be logical. And there's a certain level of experience and understanding that just can't be expressed through language and logic. Um, mm. He went to all the religious uh scholars and and the people he thought could give him those answers and he probably came away with a word mm -hmm. yeah that and be it used and it was not something you know like Feynman is fond of talking about how he learned all these concepts but until he learned how to label things then he couldn't communicate them to people mm -hmm. but, but then you also have to learn how to teach people in order for them to understand your labels <laughs> so, totally agree you know but um, but Frank White just had this theory, like something has to happen when people see the Earth from space, and so he he set out to interview all these inter uh, all of these astronauts and ask them what was your experience like, and they all said the same thing. He's interviewed over sixty astronauts now, over a period of thirty years, and he keeps updating his book. It's uh it's right now going to the fourth edition. And over time, as he has talked to these people throughout 30 years, he found that they, they take more time to integrate what they learned. You know, they come away with new ideas about what they experienced. So some people experience something really profound that immediately changes them. And other people, they'll come away and say, oh, I'm just now beginning. You're extracting from me what I've learned and I'm just now learning. So I think that you would be extremely interested to to delve into that work. It's it's what totally. drives it's totally what drives what I do because I was telling you earlier that um, my last interview actually was with astronaut Nicole Stott, and she is an artist. And Wait, also, you're telling me so you're telling me that I'm following the episode that had an astronaut previously. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, my name is Nicole Stott. I'm uh, an artist and mom and wife and retired NASA astronaut. So I painted in space, which at the time, you know, when I took the little paint kit with me, I thought, oh, this is just something I enjoy doing. Why not do it in space? I had somebody encourage me, thankfully, to think about those kinds of things, like take the human with you on your human space flight, right? And uh, so thankful for that. And you know, as I was thinking about um, retiring from NASA, I was like, man, you know, how do I uniquely share this experience? And I just kept coming back to that opportunity to paint in space. 
And art to me, I mean, it's like this universal communicator, right? Um, I don't care what language you speak, you know, whatever, the, the music, the sounds of it, the, you know, visuals we get from painting or, you know, dance, um, those kinds of things get into you regardless of where you're from <laughs> on the planet. And we can communicate really complex things through, through art. And we can communicate really simple lessons like, you know, the ones I learned, which are we live on a planet, you know, we're all earthlings. Only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere that blankets us all. And I don't know, it's funny, like whether people like my art or not isn't important to me. It really, it's, it's my interpretation. It's going to be what it is, right? But if I can engage people in this backstory of all that we're doing in space together to you know, ultimately improve life here on earth, then I, I, I don't know, I consider that my next mission in life. <laughs> I just thought about that question that people ask me all the time where they're like, hey, great, would you ever go to Mars? And I'm like, yeah, if I could take my equipment with me, <laughs> you know, like if I can record, I don't know if I even need the internet at that point. I mean, I do, but you know. You'll have it. It's yeah. Starlink is going to be the internet on Mars. It's I heard, I heard Starlink is, man, that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's quite real. I'm at every single launch. We just had one like two or three days ago. We've got launches like four times a month here at the Space Coast, thanks to Starlink, because they're just shooting them up. Um, but yeah, on the topic of, of the overview effect, what astronaut Nicole Stott said was, I'm so grateful to Frank White because he gave us the language that we didn't have. We, we um, I will speak for anyone who's flown in space are thankful to him for, I don't know, putting into a philosophy to a, a way of understanding, I think, what we all kind of struggle to share, you know, to share how, how it's impacted us. And he's just so beautifully done that and, and then, you know, shared it with everyone too, that it's um, very thankful to him for for doing what he's done and continues to do to try to encourage us too, you know, but there's this um, very human side to it all where I think when we do anything that we find extraordinary, we don't just live it, right? We don't just, we're not just there doing it, but we're seeing it, we're feeling it. It's like becoming part of us. And that in space flight is really central. I mean, there's the visual, you know, that you can't deny the, the, this appearance of our planet out the window, which by the way, is a planet, you know, you get that reality, <laughs> reality check that, you know, a lot of times we don't just think of very often, right? And um, that that's our home. And, um, and then you feel it in a way, you know, emotionally, but you also, you know, you're floating now as you're seeing that through the window. And there's just this kind of, I don't know, overwhelmingly beautiful sensory, thing that goes on that's that's a very transcendent experience as well yeah and she's like you know before that I was just explaining like I I came back changed I came back and I was desperate uh to change the world you know Ron Guerin he was a fighter pilot left was viewing earth from space from the international space station while perched at the edge of the robot arm the Canada arm and there was like nothing between him and the world and the world. And he's just flying slowly through space and it just hit him. On the third spacewalk of that space flight, my feet were clamped to the end of the space station's robotic arm. And with me attached to the arm, it was flown through a maneuver that we called the windshield wiper, which took me across this big arc across the top of the space station and back. So at the top of this arc, I was about 100 feet above the space station, looking down at this enormous, incredible space station against the backdrop of our indescribably beautiful planet 240 miles below. The sheer beauty of that took my breath away. But more important than the beauty was the incredible human accomplishment that the space station represents. It's not only an amazing technological accomplishment, probably the most complex, complicated structure ever built, but an amazing example of international cooperation. And as I hovered there above the space station, I thought about the fact that 15 nations, some of these nations weren't always the best of friends. Some were on opposite sides of the Cold War, opposite sides of the space race. Some fought wars against each other, but somehow they were able to 
find in the awe and wonder of spaceflight uh, a way to set aside their differences and do this amazing thing in space. They were able to live out the promise of Earthrise. And I wondered as I covered up there, what would the world look like? How many fewer problems would we have if we were able to bring that same level of cooperation, that same level of collaboration down to our interactions on the Earth's surface? All right, let me ask you this question. Why do you think that people like him, astronauts, uh, the people who can put human beings into space, why do you think they're not as popular as, let's say, athletes or entertainers? I don't know. I think it's kind of changing, I hope. But it's not like they'll ever be like Tom Cruise. Like everyone knows now that Tom Cruise is about to go to space, right, and make a movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard about that. But few people know that astronaut Richard Garriott already did that. You know, like, I mean, it was he made a fun sci-fi he made really? a fun like home movie and he, he made a joke about it with Tom Cruise. But, but yeah, he was like one of the first private citizen astronauts who also invented video games basically. Um, yeah. With the Ultima series or, or PC games, I guess it is. Oh, okay. But you know, this guy should be just as famous as Tom Cruise, if you would ask me. And I don't know. I think, as someone who does a lot of space outreach and talks about these people a lot, I find that, you know, most people, most people don't even think we went to the moon. Um, I would love to pick your brain on that as far as just why science literacy seems to be uh, taking a step back in the last uh, 20 years, in my opinion, 20, 25 years. It seems like Americans are less scientifically literate than ever before. I wonder, I don't know for sure because, you know. I speculate, by the way, I don't have any data to back that up. That's what I was going to say. I don't have data. So I feel like we feel a certain thing because of the way the media portrays us and we feel like we're living in idiocracy. <laughs> but, right. Great movie. Right. But here I am having this amazing discussion with you and I'm seeing the art that you put out and the community that you've built. And I'm like, is the data really in? You know, are we actually revealing the data? Are we maybe progressing and we feel like we're not? I don't know. But My question to you is, are there more people out there like the people within this community? Or, or are most people just kind of, you know, glossy eyed about science and they really don't care and they're, they're skeptical about it? You know, every scientific discovery, because I know people who are, you know, I'm it's not like we, we work together or anything like that. I just know them through other people, but it's like they question essentially everything from uh, whether we can even leave the planet, whether the planet is round. I mean, it, everything mm -hmm. is questionable at this point. So then the question becomes, how do we get to this point? And I have a, an answer for that just, and I'll throw Please. it back to you. But I think that because attention and validation has become such a currency mm -hmm. that most people who say like flat earthers, I don't believe that flat earthers really believe that the world is not spherical. I think they know that there's a certain amount of attention that you get when you say that. Mm -hmm. And that's the most amount of attention that most of those people will ever get ever in their life. As a person who's gotten any type of attention at all, I know how addicting it could be. I know people out there who are like, man, I just, I need to get, you know, uh, you know, 10,000 subscribers or I need to get, you know, X amount of followers. I know how that feels, that desire to, to put yourself on and to have a voice and to be heard by people. And some people, in my opinion, they feel like that is the, the way that they have to do that. And that's why they say stuff like that. But if you hook them up to a lie detector, a polygraph, I know they're not admissible in court, but in <laughs> some way where we could absolutely tell if they were lying or not, I bet you less than 10% of those people actually believe that. I hope you're right. Um, I hope you're right. I have, I don't know. But we can't prove it though. That's the thing. Unless we had some infallible way of proving it, we couldn't prove it. I do know that as I've been touring around, I mean, honestly, especially outside of the U S a lot of people outside of the U S definitely don't think that we went to the moon, <laughs> which well, blows my mind. You, how, how many places have you been to uh, outside the United States? Um, well, I lived in Spain for three and a half years and then nice. I've been to Argentina a few times and I've talked to people there about this. Um, 
And it's not like you couldn't reach out to people in different parts of the world on the internet, right? Oh, sure. So it's, yeah, it's definitely not like, but, and the reason why I asked that is because I too have noticed that as well, where people are much more about skeptical about the claims of America than Americans are, mm-hmm. which depending on which side of the political aisle you fall on, you're either completely skeptical or 100% gullible. It, it's never anywhere like where you have like a, a balanced perspective as to why things are the way that they are. You know, and I think that um, what I've kind of come to come to the conclusion that um, I personally had a really strange upbringing. I had a very strange education that is not at all like, I don't know how rare it is. I hope it's super rare, but I didn't discover, um, I, I never went through logic training. I never was told about critical thinking. I never learned science. You know, I was in my mid to late 20s when I discovered these things. Really? Mm hmm. Yeah, I discovered Carl Sagan's Cosmos in my late 20s. <laughs> Fell madly in love. But um, so part of me wonders like, is that, is it, is it that people just don't have the skills of logic and they're not taught, you know, how to think for themselves? And so, either way, what I've come away with is I just want to now help people think on bigger scales outside of themselves, um, outside of their lifespan, you know? And when you do that, you have to, you have to develop a framework for thinking logically, you Mm -hmm. know? So I I feel like I know kind of an answer in a way that I'd like us to go, but I don't know why we're in the situation we're in right now. Yeah. It's something I think about a lot. All the time. Um, So I do, I know, you know, I don't want to take you over too much, but if you have some time. No, I got time. I got time. I got all the time you need. Because I've been like babbling about stuff. And to be completely honest, I am really excited to know more about your inspiring journey Mm. as as much as you're willing to go into it. Yeah. So, so cool. Awesome. So people know that you are now um, this successful rapper You've made an amazing name for yourself. You're teaching people. Um, But your start was pretty tumultuous. And I've only received a little bit of the information I could find on the internet. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about young? Yeah. So um, for those who are not aware of my backstory and, and how I grew up and all that type of stuff, I grew up as a ward of the court in the state of California in LA in the 80s and 90s. And for those who may not be aware, LA was a very tumultuous place, very volatile place during that time. Um, The mother I was born to was 14 and some change, or had just turned 15, I'm sorry, because August and then I was born in September. So she had just turned 15. So if you you wanna say 15, fine, 14, that's fine. my father was in his 20s, I'll just leave it at that. And uh, my biological mother and my biological father were never really a part of my life. My, my, my biological father was killed uh, in the late 80s due to gang violence and my biological mother, uh, for this short amount of time that we knew each other, it obviously wasn't something that was compatible. So I spent essentially 18 and a half years as a ward of the state. Um, You know, something like 21, 22 different group homes in about 19 years, depending on what you would consider a group home and a placement and all of those different things, foster care, juvenile hall, McLaren hall, different group homes all over LA, Compton, Long Beach, Carson, Torrance, Palmdale, Lancaster, doesn't matter. And so when I was in 99, I got arrested for, you know, something stupid, just running the streets and, and you're, you're hanging with people you shouldn't be hanging with and you get sweet, they get swept up and you get swept up. And so um, when I was locked up, I had kind of first started being introduced to type of formal uh, drilling ceremony or you know, uh, what 
you would have in, in a ROTC, right? Where you're starting to learn about order and discipline and, and cause I didn't have that, right? I didn't have a father and none of those things were really available, available to me at the time. So, um, when I got out, I was 18 already. And my probation officer had basically told me that I had two choices. I was either going to go to the conservation Corps, which was like this um, volunteer service that helped with forest fires and, and you know, um, certain volunteer services, stuff like that. <clears throat> or I was going to go to the military. Those were the two options that he gave me, or he was going to violate my probation. Now, I didn't even know he couldn't do that at the time. So it was an empty threat. <laughs> but but uh, I believed it. I was 18 and I really didn't have anything going for me anyway. So I always say that that was the best threat that that was the best empty threat I ever responded to. So I go to the military and uh, it's May 2001. Basic training. Obviously, you know what's coming. 9-11 happens in September while I'm still in training. So I have a front row seat to the world changing. And by 2002, early spring 2002, I was deployed. Um, and spent a good chunk of, I turned, let's see, I was deployed over there when I was 19, turned 20, turned 21 in Baghdad. And then basically I was back to the States by the time I was 22. Uh, but I had basically turned 21 in Iraq. And, you know, all of the things that come with being deployed and uh, being in a combat theater and, and, and all of the, the effects that it has on one psychology and, and all that stuff, it was a profound event in my life. My own personal 9-11, really. And I don't mean to sound insensitive to that event, but it, it was definitely something that knocked, you know, whatever internal structures I had to completely knock them over because for the first time I got to see the difference between society and nature in the first world. You really don't see that. You rarely see that. We're starting to see that now with some of the destabilizations of our society with the, the pandemic and social, racial and political strife and all that type of stuff. But most first worlders never see the, uh, the difference between society and nature. And when you see that at, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, um, it changes you and it changed me. So uh, after that, I basically got out of the military and went to Kansas City and I worked in a casino for about six months. And that was an eye-opening experience as well because <clears throat> I was seeing people with gambling addictions. And that was the first time I'd ever seen like real addiction. Like you, you think you know a crackhead, but you ain't never, you ain't never seen someone addicted to you didn't seen a gambling addict. Like they make crackheads look functional. That's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they really do, you know? And, and so like there was people having to get drug out of there. Like the, the, the wives would call the uh, police to have them drug out of there because they had spent the rent money and it, all kind of crazy stuff, right? Like we had to protect people when they had won the jackpots walking to their car because in that, that part of the, the area, you know, people would come and rob people, follow people home. And it's it all kind of stupid stuff. So I spent time as a uh, casino security guard. And then, you know, I got a wild hair uh, to go to school for something that I was passionate about, which was, which was sound engineering. What drew you, what was that moment of deciding I'm going to try something entirely new. Man, I had put out, not put out, but I had finished my first album, Absolute, and I was standing at a gas station and I was wondering what I was doing with my life as I was begging people to let me play my CD in their car. And that was a really humiliating time for me because here I am with all these big plans of being you know, a musician. And this was when I still had thoughts of like, I possibly could sign to a label. And, you know, Aftermath was the big label at the time. I thought Bad Boy, you know, would, would call me or something. Puffy would call. No, none of that was happening. They weren't looking for people like me. And so I'm standing at a gas station at a quick trip in Kansas City, trying to get people to listen to my music. And I, it was like, I don't see myself doing this for a long period of time. I'd go insane. 
And I started asking myself, which is interesting that you live in Florida, because I started asking myself like, okay, well, where can I go to learn the information that I need to know? And for all my full sailors out there, you know where I'm going with this, because there were two schools that, you know, were the two main schools. Now, LA School of Recording Arts, I don't count them because I'm from LA and I wasn't going back to LA <laughs> at that time. So that was already ruled out, even though it's a pretty good school. I've heard really good things about the LA uh, School of Recording. Uh, but it was either Full Sail or it was the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a coin flip because I had no real reason to go to either one, right? Like, I mean, I didn't know the military was going to pay for it. So it was like, well, where, you know, I could go to Florida or I could go to Arizona. And the only reason why I think I chose Arizona is because it was similar to Iraq mm. and it was the weather conditions. And I felt like, well, I could live, you know, I spent almost two years in Iraq. I could spend, you know, X amount of time in, in Phoenix. So I moved out to Phoenix and, you know, started going to recording engineering school. Wow. Couldn't be more different. Uh, temperature or humidity wise I should say <laughs> super dry super humid super humid yeah <laughs> and I almost did it like I, I I was there was a moment there where I thought I was going to go to full sale wow mm. and so the military covered your schooling for sound yeah engineering. yeah yeah they did the the GI Bill definitely uh helped out and you know with me not really having any anchors I'm not married I don't have any children or anything like that it was fairly easy to get by with just me and, and, and my brother from the military, you know, one of my best friends in life. And, and we were in the military together. So when we got out, we moved together. And when we moved from Kansas city, we moved to, to Phoenix together. And um, he ended up meeting his first wife, I think there uh, in Phoenix and ended up starting a family where I just, all I had was to focus on my music. I was never, really all that successful with women. So I wasn't going to be distracted like that. So for me, it was like, okay, let me just make this music. And, you know, I spent all my time just writing lyrics. I have so many beats and songs and lyrics that I've written from that time period that never came out uh, that are pretty close to album quality stuff. I mean, it is old, but, you know, if I actually wanted to, to, to retool some of that stuff, it definitely could be used there. Wow. I cannot imagine going through the archive. I've actually lost a lot of my hard drives where I've saved all my demos. And so I'm just like, you know what? Fine. Because that would have been really overwhelming <laughs> anyway to go through. <laughs> I got hard drives going all the way back to I was 18 years old. What? That's crazy. Let me show you. Let me show you. I got to show you. These right here. And I have four in my system right now. Oh my God. <laughs> How big are these? Oh man, uh, what's this? Uh, 250 gigs, a terabyte. Wow. No, that's 500 gigs. Let's see. 250. Wow. 750. One terabyte. 500 gigs plus what? 250 gigs plus I don't know 80 gigs. And then four Jeez. in my, yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's so silly. Wow. So, I mean, here you are making all of this amazing music. What, what drew you to physics? Carl Sagan. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it all comes back to Mr. Sagan. Right. And you, and you didn't know that Contact was written by him. You hadn't discovered him at 14. Hadn't disco no, Whoa. no. Yeah. So that came later. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. it was, did you say it was Cosmos? Uh, yeah, when I had gotten into like watching his Cosmo series and stuff, it was like, okay, yeah, I could do this. You know, I could see myself going to school for this and, and actually, but my problem with school has always been, um, I'm, I'm so much of a creative. It's hard for me to pay attention because if you say something interesting, I'm going to try to turn it into a rhyme. Yeah. I so it's hard for me to pay attention. <laughs> God, I can't, I, I actually do kind of know what you mean. Like someone will say something and I'll just get stuck on that thing. And then I just, uh, and then I'm, I come back and I say, I'm sorry, can you repeat the last five minutes? <laughs> and they're like, no. <laughs> it's terrible. So this is really, really interesting that it, it always comes back to Carl. God, I love Carl. You yeah. know, I actually, um, I had an amazing discussion with his daughter, Sasha, in October of last year. Really amazing really? interview. Yeah, she wrote a book I think you'll really love. It's um, 
it's about ritual for secular people, like that we have this major gap. When I've, I've heard you talk about it in your lyrics, like mm -hmm. we miss that. Um, the community of church. The, com the community of church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I grew up with that. But in your, in your song where you mention that, uh, I know which one it is. Uh, is it myth? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's funny because you guessed it before I did. I have notes. <laughs> I have notes here. Yeah, I, I'll never forget because you actually have a scene there that looked like me when I was a child. Mm -hmm. You have a scene of like the kids raising their hands in church. Oh, from Jesus Camp? That's the one. From that movie. Did you ever see Jesus Camp? That's my life. I can oh, recite wow. it. I could recite anything those kids say. Wow. Yeah, I, you know, I went through a, a phase when I was younger where... You know, I was really into theism and, and, and all that type of stuff. But as I got older, because of the Star Trek influences and the, the contact influences and stuff like that, the questions just got big, too big for religion. My questions just got way too big for what religion could offer as an answer. These days, I'm a lot more understanding mm -hmm. about religion and, and why it, it is necessary in the human condition given what our experience has been, what our, our evolutionary history has been. Um, it's not my explanation for reality. I don't, the reality of existence does not require a creator, in my opinion. Like you could pick any one of the cyclical inflationary models, uh, you know, or, or multiverse models that doesn't speak to an omniverse. And yeah, you're probably going to, in my opinion, it's going to be the same thing. So I feel like there's not really too much need for a creator in that way. But if you need that for your life to have meaning, I understand that. It's just not something that I need. Um, and there's, there doesn't have to be that being there for there to be something else beyond this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's some of the questions that I feel like we should get to as well, which are, how about let's start asking more unique questions. Like, Forget, is there a God? That's an old question, right? Mm -hmm. I'm more curious as to, can there be a universe with a God and a universe without a God? Ooh, all right, we're talking multiverse now. Yeah, yeah. it's all like, right. is there, a, 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 I have a weird theory about reality. Tell me. You wanna hear it? <laughs> of course. So, so the reason why people are like, so what, what's the difference between your omniverse and just the regular multiverse, right? And it's a unique question. I, it definitely is a question that begs some thinking. And I, I tend to answer that question by saying, in the omniverse, all realities are equally true and false. So this reality is no more true than the Marvel reality is false to ours. Mm. Uh, every type of reality that can be conceived of through any type of intellectual thought from any species who's ever existed throughout all of time uh, has the same validity as far as if they're real or not. The definition of real is real important because we then get to ask the question, what is real? The primary word in reality is real. Mm -hmm. So what is that? And that is one of the fundamental base questions where you say, if you answer that question, well, how you don't answer if that what you described is real or not. So the omniverse at least gives this, this kind of blanket where it's like, well, it doesn't have to be real because none of this is real. It's all equally true and false at the same time. This could be in the imagination of some guy in a, in a cell or this could be, we could be the first of us of a technologically communicative species in this reality, in this universe of these laws of physics. And it could be both. Mm. This, this is the kind of thinking I get to when I think about the simulation hypothesis, which, you know, it just seems like we're gonna get there eventually if we haven't already gotten there, if we're not inside of it already and we're inside a hundred thousand versions of a simulated reality and then at what point do you say what is real and what isn't real because if if you're living inside of the simulation then to you that is real right mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of lose myself 
<laughs> well, I, I'm not even sure if the person inside the simulation is less real than the person who created the simulation. By what standards are we using to define that that is more real than the other? Which is the original substrate? Mm. What is the original base of reality? And I argue there is none. With that, though, there are some consequences, right? Because I feel like we, you fly right in the face of the standard model. You completely throw out Big Bang cosmology altogether, right? Like mm -hmm. most of the inflationary models are basically null and void uh, because they're not necessary. Mm -hmm. And so when you get into some weird places of like, okay, the standard model as well as quantum mechanics are pretty good predictive models for reality. Mm -hmm. They make predictions incredibly well, incredibly accurate, you know, one part a billion or trillion or whatever it is to, to the accuracy of these, a lot of these readings. Um, I, I, what I would like to think is that if there are, I don't know, how, what's the, the expected amount of realities out there in, in Leonard Susskind's multiverse, right? The landscape cosmology is like 10 to the 10 to the 500 or something retarded, <laughs> right? It's just something ridiculous. At that number of permutation, you're going to start seeing essentially repeats of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So this reality that we're in right now, this conversation we're having the same conversation somewhere in some other time, uh, except I'm the host of the podcast, Cosmic Perspective. And I love you are it. The, 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 the rapper who talks about all the science stuff. And I'm like, I I'm so it. fascinated with all these lyrics. You're crazy. <laughs> and you're like, you know, I'm dope. You know, it's whatever. <laughs> I love this. I can't wait. I really wish I could go. I could just like hop around. Did you ever watch? Did you watch Quantum Leap? I did. Oh, Big my God. Quantum, Sky Bakula is Captain Jonathan Archer from Star Trek Enterprise. So he's oh. always going to have a place on my shelf. Absolutely. Gosh, <laughs> your shelf. So your Omniverse um, concept, I think that you have a song. I, honestly, I've just like so immersed myself and I've just been listening on repeat. I don't even know which one it was. But there is one where you're having a conversation with yourself. I think it's in type three. Mm -hmm. and, and you talk about all of the Gradens. Like you're talking to all of the Gradens at once or something. Oh, Interdimensional Council of Greys. That's the one. Yes, yes. So that's an interesting song because um, that came out around the same time as Rick and Morty came out. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people knew about the Interdimensional Council of Ricks. But what they don't know is that neither one of us originated that idea, right? Like Rick and Morty or myself. That actually comes from Marvel Comics. And a concept known as the Interdimensional Council of Reeds, which is the Reed Richards, the leader of Fantastic Four, the smartest, one of the smartest people in the Marvel Universe, if not the smartest person in the Marvel Universe. He creates a way to meet alternate versions of himself from different realities. And they exist in this place known as the Interdimensional Council, uh, where they all exchange ideas and stuff like that. Well, I'm sure Rick and Morty found out about that through that because it predates by at least 25 years, mm. but uh, maybe 20 years, but either way, that was where I got that idea from. So it was the idea that everyone has a version of themselves out there in reality that's smart enough to come up with an idea to where they can interact with each version of themselves in different realities. And so Inter Interdimensional Council of Grace was that song. Um, and I always wanted to write that song from type one. I wanted to write that song and it just finally got a chance to write it in, in type three. I, it's so awesome. We should probably say you have a trilogy type one, two, and three that are Qu just quad quadrilogy actually, because I'm ah, working on type four right now. No kidding. But what is type four? <laughs> oh man. Type four is crazy. Uh, type four is actually uh, not an album itself. It's actually a sequence of albums. So type four is four albums containing wow. 16 songs each. So 64 songs, one for each, each square on the chessboard. And the general idea was, is that I was going to emulate the first three albums in, in kind of in a modern way with kind of modern content. Uh, City on the Type of Forever was the first album of four. Um, Last of the Rhyme Lords was the second. 
City on the type of forever was supposed to be more like the Carthage of scale type one. Last of the Rhyme Lords was supposed to be like type two. Iron Star era, or I'm sorry, Tour of the Orphan Knight was supposed to be like type three. And Iron Star era was supposed to be a little bit more of like a closure of like, hey, here's a, a cap on all of this stuff and all the legacy song conclusions, all of the things that I needed to close up that I left open. That was where that stuff was going to go. So yeah, it's, it's four albums, 16 songs each on each album. And it's meant to represent each square on the chessboard. Wow. How, okay. I need to know how you accomplish all of these things. What is a typical, <laughs> what is a typical day like for you? Do you have a set of rituals or schedule that you stick to? Uh, yeah, for the most part, um, depends on what mode I'm in. So there's two modes, there's writing and there's producing. It's hard to be in both at the same time. Right. When you're when you're making music, it's hard to form words into things that make sense. When you're forming words into things that make sense, it's hard to actually make and play music. And I'm, people don't realize how hard that actually is, but it's very hard. So depending on which mode I'm in, it's a little bit different. From writing lyrics, I'm a little bit more, there's a little bit more leeway because I'm, I feel like I'm a little bit better of a writer of lyrics than I am as a musician. When I'm producing, I'm a lot more strict about what I'm doing in my schedule because I need to, it's volume producing. So mm -hmm. it's produce as much as I can and pick out the gems because mm -hmm. like, I don't know, 60, 70% of the stuff's not going to be that great. And I need to make a good chunk of it so I can pull out, okay, this sample, um, you know, this beat, uh, this particular sound that I want, whatever it is, I need to be more strict about that because if they don't care about the music, they're not going to care about what you, you say in the lyrics. So I have to be way more strict about the music side of it than the lyric side. Lyrically, I trust myself a lot more because I know I'm playing to a specific audience. Like if you have an IQ that's, I don't know, above 100, you're probably going to be interested in what I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, so my typical day as a, as, a, as a writer, which the mode I'm in right now goes a little something like this. I wake up at around 6.30, 7 in the morning. Uh, I basically, if I haven't, thrown my gi in for jujitsu at 10, then I basically throw my gi in, but usually it's, it's pretty washed. Um, and if I stream in the morning, which sometimes I do, if I stream in the morning, then I'll go ahead and knock out my stream from like 7.30 to like 8.30, 9.15-ish. And then I'll take my gi and I'll go to jujitsu and then I'll come back. And when I get back, I'll eat my meal prep. My, my meal's already prepped for the week. Um, I usually throw on my ankle weights just to add a little weight to, to me running around. And then I come and I sit down and I usually open something on YouTube that's going to inspire me to write. So people like uh, Isaac Arthur or Vsauce or Joe Rogan's podcast or something like that. And they'll say something in a certain way and I'll say it, I'll repeat it right after them. And I'll figure out how to rhythmically say it. And I'll write that down, just those words down. And now my mind is going all the different ways I can rhyme that. Forget the context, forget how to make it mean something. Just rhyme it, hard rhyme, best you can do. Once I come up with those two, I look at those two lines and I'm like, okay, how can I make this make sense? And so I then start adjusting, I start saying, okay, this word is unnecessary. This is a filler word. This is a three syllable filler word. Let me replace this three syllable word with a, a three syllable word that's not a filler that actually means something. And I'll do that for about an hour, two hours until I'm, I get exhausted. And then I go jump on the Xbox. I'll play some hockey or play some basketball and I'll get my ass whooped. When I lose games on Xbox against humans, it makes me want to write even more. That's the mm -hmm. first thing I do when I get off. If I, if I win, I get lazy. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, I feel real good. Now I don't have to do anything. It's like, no, you're still a rapper. You're not a professional video gamer, bro. So, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of happens. So after that, usually I hook up with uh, my buddy RK. We'll do a podcast that day. We usually do daily podcasts. Um, it usually takes about 40, 45 minutes. And then after that, I usually meet with my crew, uh, my senior staff, which is the Unified Federation Star Citizen Guild that we have. And I usually meet with my senior staff or my, my chief tactical officer, my chief security officer, get the plans for whatever mission we have that we're doing on our meetup time. Uh, and then I start prepping for the next day. I start, um, you know, getting my gi in the, in the washer. I start 
you know, doing my nightly stretches. I start getting all my news and stuff. And then for musically, the last thing I'll do is I'll start rehearsing all the stuff that I wrote that day. So that when I wake up the next day, it's, I don't forget it. Because what happens is you'll write something, but you'll forget how you said it. How did I say this? And I'm reading stuff that I wrote from years ago and I have no idea how I wrote it. Ugh. So what do you do with all these lyrics, but you don't know how to say it? Yeah. This is, a, this is an incredibly strict regimen, which I'm guessing the military is what gave you that discipline, right? Uh, not as much as no. you might think. Uh, here's what I'll say about the military and discipline, because that is a common misconception. Okay. You get discipline if the drill sergeants in basic training care about you. Mm. By care about you, I have to give a shout out to Drill Sergeant Dingle and Drill Sergeant Sturm, my two drill sergeants at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And they cared about us in the sense that, you know, it was like a good cop, bad cop, old head, young dude dynamic, right? You know, the, the young drill sergeant was the bad cop and he was so energetic. He was just so gung ho about everything. And, you know, let's go, 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 go. Everything was just, and the older one, Drosar Dingle, was much more cool and relaxed. And he was just, he was like the sheriff with the cool glasses that just, you know, is just looking out at the world, just got his eye on everything. And um, he didn't say much because he let Drosar and uh, Sturm do all the talking. But when he spoke, everybody listened. Um, that was probably the most amount of discipline that I had in the military. After that, it's pretty much a job, you know, like you... You wake up in the morning, you go to, you know, you do, you salute the flag, you go to PT. After that, you go back to the barracks and you, you know, wash up, you go to chow. Then you report to work at nine. Lunch is at 1145. You come back at 115. You know, uh, call of duty is, uh, uh, what, 415 maybe? People are closing up shop around four on what? base. Really? Yeah, yeah, man. Like, oh, man. I hate to throw people under the bus for shamming, mm. but we used to sham hard. And for those who don't know what sham means, it means you look like you're working, but you're not really working. This, this actually, this is a, a <laughs> I come from a military family. I'm the only child that did not go into the military. So now I feel like I have something. <laughs> yeah. Just be like, just tell them, just tell them like, y'all be shamming. You know, you be shamming. Get out of here. Um, but I know I, I love anybody who's ever put on the uniform, um, any branch. And, and I just feel like to, in order to swear that oath, it's most important that you swear that oath in times like this. Uh, and I never want people who who put on that uniform and swore that oath to forget that. Mm. Here, here. But if if that's not where your discipline came from, I actually just remembered a uh, lyric from your song, "The Master," "The Master Paradox." Mm. There's a line that I I took down. It's, "Let us pause for the derelict cause a former derelict." Let us pause for the perilous cause. Perilous a former cause. derelict. Yeah, a former derelict who would become a master line. because he cared to evolve. Because he cared to evolve. Yeah. You know, I wrote that song about someone. Who was it about? Uh, I wrote that song about a Brazilian jiu jitsu black belt wow. named Jes Jesus. Yeah. Um, he was a fan of my music and he became a friend. Uh, and I wrote that when he got his black belt as a way to kind of honor the struggle of becoming a black belt, especially in something like jujitsu, which if you ever roll, anybody who rolls knows it is like the, look, I know wrestling, wrestlers are gonna be like, we don't my wrestling, but it's like the soccer of martial arts. Mm. Um, other than wrestling, which is a even more endurance uh, demanding, but Brazilian jujitsu and what it takes to make that your entire life, I thought what he did deserved song you know you ever see something or, or hear about something that someone does and you're like that that deserves a song i'm sorry that just mm -hmm. that deserves a song you know you you won a medal of honor you, you pulled someone from the wreckage you you lifted a car off a child or that deserves a song i'm gonna write a song about that so it's, if you ever do something crazy expect a song written out it's the hero's journey mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely hero's journey uh, but as far as discipline, I say I got that a little bit from just the mistakes that I made uh, learning. I was a hard-headed learner, uh, especially when it came to the discipline of understanding what I had as an artist. 
I didn't understand that I was, I had a voice that was influential until maybe type two. Wow. That was about the time where I was like, okay, people are really paying attention to what I'm saying. I should probably, like somebody sent me a message and they were like, hey, Graydon, I let my kids listen to you. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> uh -oh. I started thinking about all the songs that I wrote where I said this word and that word and thought about Summer's Ending where I used the C word. And I'm just like, God, oh man, I wish I would have changed. There are certain songs that I just wish I would have done differently, you know, like the N word. I just wish I would have done that differently. It was a, mm -hmm. like a 25, 26 year old kid who wrote that. And I just, you know, you don't really know, but you try. Uh, you know, I actually, uh, Summer's Ending was something that really hit me. The video is incredible. Ha who does your videos? Um, that one was actually done by someone else. Um, I can't think of uh, what the guy's name is because it's been so long since we've actually talked. Um, but I'll definitely get his information for you. I actually don't have a lot of video contacts like that. Most of the times I get sent videos, they're fan-made videos. Wow. Um, you know, the ones that I do do uh, are done by either Dabby Dreads, um, who is kind of like my main video guy. But most of the time, it's a fan-made submission. Omniverse was a fan-made submission. Oh, I was wondering. I had no hand in that. And um, there was a guy on Twitter named uh, Coffee and Music. Coffee, the letter N, and Music. And he wow. sent it to me and he was like, hey, man, I don't know if you uh, accept fan submissions or anything like that, but I did this video for you. And I was like, bro, this is crazy. And I put it up and people loved it. It's amazing. That, well, that's where I got my start. So Absolutely. In this, um, you talk about, I'm so sorry, what is the name? The, the, you, you were having a mission meeting every day. You have a meeting with your team, the Federation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, yeah. What are you doing? So, oh man, you're going to open up a whole different uh -oh. thing. <laughs> well, we could always schedule. Like, oh no, no. This is, uh, yeah, this is, I'll, I'll give you a, a brief, quick sort of thing. So, um, I play a game, a PC game called Star Citizen. Mm. And, uh, I'm a huge fan of science fiction and, and Star Trek. And, uh, I grew up on, on Star Trek, Deep Space Nine. I, obviously I watched the next generation as well, but Deep Space Nine is what really, you know, Benjamin Sisko is my TV dad. Mm -hmm. So it's for me, that show is what a lot of people's like childhood based show is. And um, so I always wanted to be able to, to be that, to want to have my own kind of crew and my own organization where we set off in the stars and we discovered green aliens and we, you know, had adventures. And so when Star Citizen was beginning its development in 2012, um, it was then that me, Tombstone the Dead Man, uh, Clifford Douglas, also known as Dabby Dreads, we created the Unified Federation, which was a, basically like a Star Trek version of Grand Unified, which is the community that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about the UF as it relates to GU is, you mentioned earlier that the community is just very empathetic and, and very civil and communicative. That is even a very informal version of GU because the Unified Federation is a more formal version of that. Mm, wow. They are, because they are subscribing to perform a duty within this particular game function. So this game allows you to do multi-crew functionality where you could have someone at helm when they're flying the ship. You can have someone at the turret gunner on the starboard turret or the port turret. You can have people on an away team and them go off to the planet while you stay in space and you monitor the whole thing. So we created it to where it was built kind of like Star Trek. You had your security department, you had your operations department, you had your engineers and your department heads were the ones that you would coordinate in the same way that in the military, you would coordinate with your platoon sergeants or your platoon leaders, the way they would coordinate with the company commander or the first sergeant or the, the NCOIC, the battalion NCOIC or the brigade NCOIC, whatever it was. So we meet, sometimes it's not every night, sometimes it's every other night, but it doesn't go too long before we actually speak because we got to prep for missions on, on Sundays. But, what we actually do is 
what I try to do is I try to create missions that build our chemistry, create missions that, that allow us to become a more cohesive unit so that when we are under fire and we're in times of stress, when orders or directives are given, the response time or the ping is so much lower than everyone else. When other people play the game, it's like they're playing, but they're having fun, but they don't understand, understand that in a firefight, seconds matter. Mm-hmm. And you have to be able to make a call on the fly that when I make the call, it's gonna affect everybody on the ship. And there are 20, 25 people on the ship, plus there's air tac, you know, our air tactical guys running air caps, protecting these guys, plus, you know, we got a security force, we just a whole bunch of moving parts that we have to coordinate. So my department chiefs, my chief of security, my chief of uh, chief tactical officer, my chief of engineering, they all come to me and they're like, hey, just want to let you know X, Y, Z. And I'm like, all right, cool. Or, hey, belay that we need to do X, Y, or Z. So that's what that really is relating to when I talk about that. And it's all basically taking place in this game called Star Citizen. And it's the most realistic game ever created. I think it's the greatest game ever. Oh, so that's probably the image I see at the top of your website. Yeah, that's directly from the game. Wow, that is so beautiful. Have you ever seen it? No. Mm -mm. The game? (laughs) Never. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. I I mean, look, I'm biased. I'm a complete stan. So I'm what they would call a white knight for Star (laughs) Citizen. I make no bones about that. I can critique it when it's, it's necessary for me to critique it. But this is essentially the greatest game ever conceived. Wow. That's the period. Yeah, that that's it. I mean, there's there's I can't even think of another game I would even put in that that conversation. What were you about to ask? How long have you been playing this game, especially consistently with your with your team? Um well, so we've been on together since 2014, 2013. I mean, the Kickstarter went around came out in like 2016 or I'm sorry, 2013. And we had been planning since like 2012, since the Kickstarter actually been announced. So, um, yeah, it's been about good six, seven years we've been together. Wow. What Kickstarter mm-hmm. are you referring to? The Star Citizen Kickstarter. Got it. Which was, yeah, the game actually was born out of a uh, crowdfunding project. Wow. Yeah. And they've raised now $400 million since oh 2012. It's the largest crowdfunding <laughs> project of all time I mean, it's easily and there are people like me people like you who love space who love space adventures and this appeals directly to them uh, i would love to see i tell people this all the time i would love to see more women play star citizen i mm-hmm. think it's such a, a fantastic experience for those who enjoy uh space travel and space flight and you know, uh, warp speed and first person shooters and going down the planets and exploring and all that type of stuff. It's, it's just awesome. Uh, I wish there were, there was more women, but the people who are, and there are women who are interested in the game now, but the people who are interested, most of them really, really love it because there's nothing like it on its scale. You know, I got to say, being someone who works in the space industry, there are a ton of women. There are a ton of women, you know, documenting. There are a ton of women, um, you know, astronauts now, although only of the 570-ish people that have been to space, I just learned today. Today's the day that the first woman uh, went to space. In 1963, Valentina Tereshkova was, uh, you know, from the Soviet Union at the time, and she launched to space on this day orbited the earth 48 times, I think, and then had to eject herself from the capsule <laughs> and parachute four miles to uh, the Central Asian land. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I read up a little bit about some of those Russian uh, cosmonaut space experiments of those times, and they were not the safest. I mean, there was a real race, and they didn't care about safety at that time. That's one thing I love about SpaceX, because mm-hmm. say what you want about Elon Musk. He is paranoid about safety. He's literally paranoid about safety. And he knows that any type of like, I hate to use this in a really insensitive way, but I'm just using it as an example, but any type of challenger type incident, mm-hmm. he will never survive that. 
Mm-hmm. So he knows like he has to be so on the ball to where if something does happen, it can't be on him. It can't be on him. Yeah. Because it, it's so much at stake with his legacy. You know, we we talk about that a lot among ourselves. I guess my reporter friends and I, it's like, are we ready for that to happen? Because it just feels like mistakes are going to happen all, along mm-hmm. the way. And it, and I don't know if anybody's really prepared for that. And I was thinking about it um, because just a couple of weeks ago, SpaceX launched humans. They were, they returned human spaceflight to these launch pads right here for the first time since the end of the shuttle era, which ended mm-hmm. because of those accidents. And so I was thinking about it and you know, I, I had met Bob and Doug and I knew about their families and I had talked to Nicole, at, uh, Nicole Stott, their dear friend, and I knew that their children were watching. And here I was just a few miles away from the launch pad and I just started bawling. Like the, I've seen so many launches. I, I cry at every launch, but I see so many that I, it it's was a, different. It's a tear inducing event to see. I mean, even when you see it on, Okay, so I'm just going to full disclosure here. There were times in human history where I cried. Uh, when Obama got elected, I cried. I just felt like it was such a monumental event for the country at the time. Little did I know that was probably going to be the best of race relations for the next decade. But uh, it was definitely <laughs> something I, I, I felt like emotionally moved by. And if I saw, if I was physically there at a... a um, at a launch. I mean, I cried at the, the end of the Star Trek Picard season finale. So <laughs> I, I, I could definitely see myself crying for humans launching themselves into space at great risk and reward to the species. So, you know, I definitely feel like that. It, it was insane. I mean, I bawled my face off. Oh my God. <laughs> I was so overwhelmed with joy that um, that we humans decided to go for it. But then I, I was also um, had a pretty intense feeling of fear and anxiety. Like, oh my God, what if this doesn't go right? I, I don't know. I've, I've never seen it go wrong, but one of these days it might. And I just, I'm not prepared. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I, you know, it's funny because I think in a lot of cases, Elon and SpaceX in general, they take tons of risk. They move really fast. They're like programmers. They release early and iterate often. That's kind of the mantra. But when it involves humans, especially because they were working with the NASA commercial crew program, it's very different. It's gone a lot slower and, and it's more methodical. And, and you can see the reverence in Elon's eyes when he, he enters the press room and there's talk of humans or the president of SpaceX, Gwen Shotwell. She actually spent a lot of time trying to humanize Bob and Doug. Bob and Doug are dads. Bob and mm. Doug have wives. Bob and Doug's sons are going to be at the launch. You know, She's like, I wanted all my engineers to know that this is not These another- yeah these are people yeah and you know what's interesting about that is we as as people observers people who are not in the field of space exploration we tend to dehumanize these people uh in in a way where they don't seem real uh they seem like um almost like actors uh like a basketball player like it it's the furthest thing from that because all of the hopes and the the dreams of human innovation and exploration ride on each launch and the setback if something goes wrong is always going to be monumental because no one's going to be the next one to want to take that risk after something has happened unless they're absolutely sure that the risk to them is minimized in some kind of way so i think that's that's a real interesting perspective to to, to look at it with you know, I'm glad you say that because I kind of forget. I mean, I see these people a lot. I feel really lucky. That's honestly 
part of my whole mission is to try to transport people to it to my perspective because mm-hmm. like i like i told you before we started the call i live in this amazing i call it the awe bubble mm-hmm. and i don't think it's a derogatory thing um uh, it's beautiful in here and I just want to expand it. I want to pop it <laughs> I like everybody in here to see that these are beautiful humans who just like the Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt who just kept putting one foot in front of the other and said, yes, it's worth it. Yes, I'm going to get up and do this. Yes, I'm going to keep trying. Yes, I know this is insane. What am I doing? Who am I? Imposter syndrome. Just going to keep taking steps. And you know what's interesting? The analogy that you used is in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, just like the science of, or, you know, the study of discovery and in, in, in sciences, you're going to get beat up a little bit. Um, you're going to take some bumps. You're going to take some bruises. You're going to tap. There are going to be times where you're just like, you know what? I, I, we can't. I don't know how to process this. We need to step away, come back with a new approach because this idea submits our reasoning every time. And so uh, that analogy I think holds true uh, because you're going to take your lumps and you're going to, you're going to be a white belt. You know, human beings are probably white belts when it comes to space exploration, or we might've just gotten our blue belt. You know I mean? It could be a hundred years before we get purple. It could be 500 years or a thousand before we get brown. What does a black belt space faring civilization look like? I want to know. I want to know. I I actually <laughs> I love that you brought that up. Do you know what an astronaut candidate is called while they're an astronaut candidate? Uh, I don't. I, uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Ask can. <laughs> an ask can. I heard Bob and Doug say, I think it was Bob who said it. He's like, you know, when I was an ask can, <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> Well, they can call themselves that. I won't call themselves that because they are so much uh, cooler than I am. Let me ask you this question. Has there ever, I, I don't think there's ever been any rap played on the space station or in space. What is the oh, like? Oh, sure. Do you think so? Do you want to know? Like, what, who? Who's been the only, I want to know. Because I've made a reference to that in my music and I'm sure no one's played me on the space station. Well, we should change that. I don't know how we do it, but I, I think we can, we can try. Okay. I think there are ways we can try. But I will say that um, I don't know about rap specifically, but I do know that um, they've experimented with really cool things like blasting because, you know, they've got the microgravity physics environment to play with where everything is different. There's the lack of gravity means you can look at cells in 3D. They don't flatten out on the Petri dish. You can look at water in 3D or just floats and they'll blast. Fire, fire waves. Yes. Mm -hmm but they'll blast music at water to visualize the, the waves that as they're happening, visualize what happens to this crazy water. And so they blasted metal at it. I'm sure they blasted rap at some point. Um, But I will say that I just recently heard from Leland Melvin, who was um, an amazing, he's, he's one of my favorite um, astronauts. I've met him several times. He's really sweet. He's an amazing musician like cl- classically trained pianist, oh, beaut- wow. amazing poet. He played football professionally mm. and he talks about the overview effect, which I, I mentioned to you. He, it's like, it's kind of like his life mission. He just talks about the, the perspective that he got from space, the unifying perspective. And he talks about this moment where he went over to the Russian module. But uh, we get there and you're looking at what's happening. You can smell the beef and barley cooking. You can see the people's eyes lighting up as we think about the people that we're, we're working with. People we used to formally fight against. The Germans, we were warring against Russia, the Cold War. And all these things were going on. African American, Asian American, French, German, Russian, the first female commander, breaking bread, having this meal, Listening to Sade Smooth Operator. (laughs) Listen to this. And this is when my perspective changed. This is when I got this cognitive shift. It wasn't the technical things. It was us working together as one civilization, breaking bread, having a meal, just like you're going to do tonight, just like you do at home with your family. It changed my life. And I think once you can bring people together off planet, 
There is no reason why we can't bring people together on planet. I have these these nerd fantasies of like, you know, some some astronaut and you know Mark Kelly's on the space station or something, and he's streaming, and in the background is my music playing, and people are yes. like, oh, you know, what's that music? And, and then like, YouTube, oh, it's great and square, you know. And then YouTube takes it down because <laughs> he's yeah, exactly. Which is well, can we talk about that? Yeah, you know, I it. get copy strikes for my own music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's I I, I, I anyway, happened to me. So we need to get you on the space station and <laughs> what else can we do? What are, what are your aspirations? Do you want to go to space actually? You ready? Uh, yeah. If you ask me tomorrow, if I would want to go to space, I would say yes. I mean, I'm, that, that answer is always going to say that, that answer is always going to be yes. So the, the, my aspirations though is to uh, turn Grand Unified into a community that is welcoming and filled with people who are astronauts, biologists, physicists, chemists, educators, um, engineers. I my dream, my my long term dream is something that I came up with years ago called the Tier Complex, which was the Trans Intellectual Education Repository Complex, which was this facility where our community could get together and the smartest of our community could educate the rest of our community to go back out into the world, almost like, uh, like proselytizing of science in a bit where it's like, Hey, we have, you know, three physicists. I mean, we have people in the community with, with doctorates in theoretical physics, right? Doctorates in particle physics and to give them a space to be able to teach the rest of us. I'm going to be in the front row in the front seat of that class at raising my hand asking questions and it's you know my quote unquote idea but for me those are where my aspirations go because i still feel like my imprint on this species is not really going to be felt until three four hundred five hundred years from now wow. so i'm trying to set it up for so that 300 years from now people can talk about grade and square the same way they talk about galileo or you know Newton or whoever. Ah, oh, I'm so glad. I wonder how we'll be able to preserve digital video. Like, do you ever wonder that? Like, how do we preserve this stuff forever? What's going to happen? They're going to make a hologram of you. They're going to make a hologram of me. It's going to range from our youngest age because they're going to be able to extrapolate with with uh, AI and, and algorithms what you looked like when you were, you know, six. And no way. They're gonna, yep, they're going to do it. Yep, that's coming. That's had, coming. Think I, about how real deep fakes are right now. No, deep fakes right. are like so real. It's you can't even distinguish you can't distinguish them from the <laughs> actual thing. It's insane. Joe wrote every time Joe says something weird, I'm like, is this real? <laughs> or or is someone make this up? I don't know. <laughs> Shout out to Joe Rogan. Oh, if you can get me on the Joe Rogan show, that'd be awesome. Hey, Joe, I just wanted to let you know that sorry I already had this amazing interview, but I will allow you to continue the conversation if you want to ask different questions or whatever. It's fine. There I think go. me and Joe would talk a lot about psychedelics and mm-hmm. inner aliens. I always thought his his thoughts on that were pretty interesting. I don't know about that, but I, I was thinking that you might have been referring when you talk about type three entities, um, transcension yes. hypothesis style entities. Mm-hmm. Yes, it, it was the transcension, transcension hypothesis did factor into some of that, but it wasn't the whole thing. Uh, I still try to make it someone where, uh, or, or something where we're talking about extraterrestrials at such a high level of technology that they might as well be godlike, they might as well be um, angelic or ma- magic because the level of technology, their mastery over time and space is just so vast that they might as well be gods. They might as well be alien super kings. This reminds me of something. What do you got? Contact. (laughs) Because the beings that were able to create the network in which Ellie Mm. uh, went through had to be at least a type two species, at least. And I'm thinking like 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 
uh, any type of intergalactic conduit through which time dilation is a thing. Uh, it's, and I know in the, in the book from, I don't know, I don't know cause I didn't read the book, but from what I hear in the book, there are allusions made to, uh, architects or, or beings that are like God, like that, you know, that actually created the, the, the gateway, the hub or whatever it is, almost in the way that Stargate, I'm not familiar if you were a Stargate fan, but I was a huge Stargate fan. Stargate no. basically had the same type of uh, mythology. No, but you, there is another line that I wrote down in one of your songs where you said something like, keep your rockets, I'll take the Stargate. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan of uh, wormholes and uh, Einstein, Rosen, Podowski bridges. I was a big sliders fan back in the day. And so, uh, I forgot know, I think, about that. Oh, remember sliders? sliders? Yeah, I totally forgot. Wow. What a great show. And, wow. and, and, and really that's a show they could remake today and I wouldn't even be mad. <laughs> I wouldn't even be mad. And I hate remakes and reboots, by the way. I do too. I know. Or like reunion tours. Those drive me crazy. It's not fair. Yeah. If you retired, retired, stay retired. Don't come <laughs> back with a reunion tour. That's do not something, necessary. Do something new. Yeah. Start that's, a new band. That's what I think too. But sometimes I still appease them. I'm like, well, I never saw the Pixies when I was younger. So I'll see them now. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I too, I, I love being here and seeing the rockets and, you know, I mean, there's, there is nothing like it. Um, it's extremely emotional, but if I really think about it on the longer scale, I'm not disappointed, but I'm definitely hopeful that mm -hmm. we can make a major breakthrough in, with theoretical physics that allows us to break the speed of light. I feel like what we're learning at the quantum level should allow us <laughs> to somehow get from here to there in uh, no time. Do you see the look on my face? Yeah. The, the reason why I had that look is because as fascinating as being able to travel faster than the speed of light would be, I don't know if our reality, our universe, and our laws of physics allow for something like that without some real causality consequences. Mm -hmm. um, things happening before the initiator, I guess, causes them. To, like, there's just this weird, I would love for us to be able to traverse vast amounts of space and time. I don't know if we do that from a point A to point B linear rocket propelled type of travel. The only way I could see us doing it is the, uh, and this is just one of many that have been proposed, but have you ever heard of the Albicure drive? No. Uh, basically it was a type of, ex it's a, it was an idea for an experimental warp engine that used exotic energy to contract the space in front of a vessel while expanding the space behind the vessel, not violating uh, special relativity and mm -hmm. basically allowing the pocket that was created to move faster than information. Yeah. It looked like kind of, I know what you're referring to now. I've seen kind of the, the illustrations. It kind of looks like a, an inchworm, like space time mm -hmm. turns into an inchworm and you're just yep. kind of using that as the belt that you move along. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And, and what you're doing essentially is not accelerating yourself up to relativistic speeds so that you're not creating all of this extra mass that needs all this extra energy to then propel that back up to uh, relativistic speeds. I, I mean, if there is a way to do it without violating special relativity and, and, and information travel. Yeah, that would be awesome. But I feel like if we're going to do it, it's going to be in such a non-intuitive way because it seems so such a non-intuitive concept to me. Like it sounds good in stories and in science fiction, but when you really get down to what it would mean to be able to travel at that speed, I mean, if you, leave anywhere at that speed you're not going to come back to anything you resemble you recognize it yeah god and then it gets down to what is consciousness and <laughs> like i think that about that too with the transcension hypothesis which i only recently learned about at burning man last year <laughs> so, really yeah do you Someone know at burning burning 
Burning Man told you about it? Do you know who, well, first of all, at Burning Man, uh, we're part of a camp that it's like a 70 person camp and we build a giant telescope dome and oh, okay. we're Black Rock Observatory. So it's an astronomy camp. We have talks all week. It's amazing. Uh, we have media meteorite museum and Jason Silva is, um, do I'm you know familiar that? with him. Techno mm -hmm. poet. Yeah. He came. He came and talked about the transition, the transcension hypothesis for a bit. I love that guy. He's great. Yeah. I mean, he, what a beautiful poet as well, right? Taking similar concepts and he he, he speaks. He reminds me of Carl Sagan in the way that he speaks. He is really thoughtful about things, and he's always doing things with lens flare and inside of nature, it's just mm -hmm. like Carl and Cosmos. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he knows how to play on that. Yeah, <laughs> it's lovely. Uh, yeah, we had um, Alex Filipenko. Do you know who he is? He Name sounds familiar. I'm not sure if I'm familiar with his work, though. You'd probably recognize his face. He's an astrophysicist on all of you know on all the documentaries. He's he's amazing. He's got the most beautiful smile in the universe. Mm -hmm. He came and yeah, we learn, we learn from all sorts of amazing people there, but um, that's where I learned about the transcension hypothesis. And I thought, yeah, that makes sense. That's where all the aliens are. They've just gone in, you know, in. Um, so how many of you are aware of uh, the Fermi paradox? Some of you. Uh. So, uh, <laughs> So uh, uh, Fermi was a physicist, mathematician, and he said, you know, looking up at the night sky, if there are all these billions and trillions of stars uh, and there's all these billions of years for intelligent civilizations to have evolved, where are they? Why do we see zero evidence of intelligent life out there? So there are many answers to the Fermi paradox, but perhaps the most interesting answer that I've come across is known as the transcension hypothesis put forward by John Smart, who's the founder of um, Foresight University. And Jason made these two incredible videos uh, <laughs> on the transcension hypothesis. And I think if you want to hear something truly mind-blowing as a response to the Fermi paradox, it's the transcension hypothesis. So maybe, Jason, you could paraphrase or summarize the transcension hypothesis? Yeah, you can give it a shot. Um, so John Smart, he came up with a theory to account for Fermi's paradox, which is again, like in, in such vastness, you know, all, all, we've found all these earth-like planets now, these exoplanets. I mean, the, the conditions for life seemingly with enough space and enough time and enough of the four most common elements that we have in our bodies that exist in the universe. I mean, it, it seems easy for other technologically advanced civilizations to have emerged and yet where where are they? You know, and, and, and I don't really ascribe to the conspiracy theories of like, oh, the US government is hiding actual little humanoid aliens with big heads. Like, and I don't know if when you're tripping on ayahuasca or DMT, the self-transforming machine elves are actual aliens from other universes. They may just be like algorithms inside your unconscious. But I think that the Fermi paradox is very, sorry, the transcension hypothesis is very interesting theory to account for Fermi's paradox. And he says, if you consider our story, as we technologically advance, we are expanding outwards, you know, like taking over all the continents, spreading ourselves all over the planet, you know, going in satellites into space, and maybe a space telescope, like we go outwards. But that together with that advancement of expansion, there is also this expansion inwards. Our technologies become like denser and denser, or the computational substrates get smaller and smaller. And the idea is that eventually we reach femtoscale densities of computation and essentially we kind of disappear out of space time. So the transcension is that, it's like an implosion out of the visible universe. And so if you think that eventually with things like mind uploading and if we're able to map the patterns of consciousness and recreate artificial intelligent organisms that can think and that can dwell in matrix-like environments when we have simulated bodies. I mean, if we can model something that feels like us, but that can live in the virtual plane, right? Or a simulacrum of some kind, and we can dispense with our bodies and the entropy that that costs us and essentially non-biological minds living in virtual universes, running on femtoscale density computers that are at the, at the density level of a black hole, that we 
implode. Like we, we transcend, transcensionize, you know, out of the visible universe. And then that's where all the technologically advanced civilizations are. So they've, they've, they've kind of like inwardly vanished. I can't, you can't prove it necessarily, but like, you know, you, you read something like that and just speculating that, like just contemplating that, I think is, is cognitively pleasurable and, uh, and worthwhile. So I, I did a, a video about that and I was like, this is something you can bring up at your next dinner party, you know? But then the question is, is where is in? Yeah. And how is that accessible? Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I, I think it's fascinating what he talks about. I think the transcension hypothesis is a fascinating concept. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't let myself get too wrapped up into that because I know that ultimately it is purely speculation. None of that stuff is testable. And if you ever talk about it with anybody else of science, they're just going to be like, are we talking science or philosophy here? Right. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They'll blow so, you right off. <laughs> yeah, they'll blow you right off. So a lot of times it's not a conversation that I get to have, but I think it is a fascinating concept as to um, what, what uh, inward means so when you're talking about space inward, maybe going to the very small as opposed to going out to the very uh, large classical scale. Well, let me pick your brain on this for a second. If this was a simulation, would FTL law still apply? Like if you lived in a computer simulation, mm -hmm. would it be necessary for you to observe the laws of uh, linear causality, if you will? Yeah. I don't know. It's fascinating to think about. I love, I love thinking about the simulation theory. I actually love thinking about all of these things just for the fun of it, just kind of like the fun brain exercise of it, not because I really think, you know, that scientifically I'm going to be doing anything very productive, but, mm -hmm. but philosophically it's fun to think about. And I bet you, I'm sorry, but I bet yeah. you think that there is something unique about reality worth exploring in that way. Right. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I think that's why we, we pursue these lines of thinking is because we know, you know, what Neo or what Morpheus told Neo in the Matrix, mm, you know, there's true. something about reality that's just not right. Something is weird. Something mm -hmm. is just off. Like I, I keep trying to catch a glimpse of it as I turn, but mm -hmm. it's just out of you, whatever that is. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, great, you sound like a theist right now. It's like, no, it's not. I'm not saying that there's some, some, some being there, but there's some type of higher order of reality that this reality sits in that is just outside our view this reminds me of what you were saying in the beginning which was um oh my gosh i just realized the time this is great <laughs> so i just uh, oh wow i didn't even realize <laughs> we just been we just been talking why not well okay so maybe we can we can begin to wrap up but mm -hmm. you talked about flatland and that mm -hmm. is what is that? The Edge of Forever? It's my favorite Cosmos episode where Carl Sagan tries to explain a tesseract, a something that we can't really possibly understand in our universe. And so he uses the two-dimensional shapes and it's the cutest thing ever. He's like, so mm. we have flat people and... <laughs> Can you imagine what type of father he was with his, his, uh, his children where... He's explaining things and he has that same charm that we all fell in love. And that coupled with the, the awe and the, uh, the interest of a child, right? The inquisitiveness of a child with the charisma of Carl Sagan. I think I, I actually thought about that a lot. And I, I've even talked to his daughter about it. And you can read her book. It's, uh, it's, it's called For Creatures Such As We. And great, something great title. I know, right? Um, something like finding meaning in an unlikely world or something like that. But she talks a lot about ritual and but then there's so much autobiography. There's so much about her mom and her dad. And like I it's can, it's touching. Can you imagine you are so great at something that your children can write an autobiography about themselves, about how they were raised by you. 
<laughs> yeah. That's the Fela thing, right? Like that's the that's how big Fela was. Femi and 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 uh, I think the, there's like three or four of them or whatever. <laughs> all of them. But like, <laughs> like all of his sons, they didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to go into music. Mm-hmm. They didn't have to become entertainers. Like their legacy is secure. Yeah. And yet still, like you're gonna go and you know get into a field where your father or you know a relative, your mother has set the standard so high. I couldn't even, I, you know, following the, being the child of, you know, Biggie or being the child of Big mm-hmm. Pun, these all-time greats that passed away too early. And Way then the early. expectations that are heaped upon their offspring, their progeny, where it's like, you got to be great too now. It's like, well, hold on. He was great. I, I'm just a kid, <laughs> you know? Oh, my God. Yeah. And, and I think when the parent puts that pressure on the kid, then something else happens too. It's like, ah, wait, wait. When there's pressure on the kid to be like the parent, whether it's from outside forces or the parent themselves. But with Carl, it seems really clear that there was no pressure whatsoever about being in science or whatever. In fact, I actually learned, you know, well, you know how much of a, um, a secular teacher he was, free thinker, um, spoke about atheism a lot. He, they read the Bible in their home, I found out from Sasha. She's like, oh yeah, we read all of the stories. Yeah, we didn't. I grew up kind of Jewish. She had Jew- her mom as uh, the Jewish family and I thought that was interesting. I, you know, it's interesting you say that because um, I talk about reading counter viewpoints often. I read the Bible, I read the Quran, I read the Torah, I read the Bhagavad Gita, I wow. read the Communist Manifesto, I read Karl Marx, I read, I've read Mein Kampf, I've read, wow. you know, anything that is of a counter, like, you know, off limits, or we're not supposed to, it's like, I'm going to read it because I need to understand what it was like to have ideas that were ostracized ideas that were challenged and were considered outside the norm how were they able to still uh get their their thoughts heard without paying the consequence of society ostracizing them uh in that way so yeah i definitely think that it's it's important for the smartest of people to read things that you disagree with Hmm. to challenge to to, to challenge your uh your you know what's it called um, your echo chamber to, to, to at least mm. try to test to see how strong um, that echo chamber actually is. If you can break it down and get some new data in there, I think that's a good thing. Ultimately, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I, um, I think that's, that's really goes back to the beginning of our discussion. That is a major issue that we have right now. We don't, I see in some circles, like in your community, Grand Unified um, and others, that this is this is people are flocking there because they're hungry for conversation they're hungry for nuance they're hungry for not cut and dry situations because that's not what we are as humans we're very complex but um i I don't know i don't know about the rest of us i feel like either it's a weird media game and they're all tricking us into thinking that this is an issue Mm-hmm. Or, or we've got a major issue where we're, it's almost like the transcension hypothesis, but not in a good way. <laughs> like we're all, mm-hmm. we're all kind of like curling into our bubbles and our, our uh, echo chambers, as you say. Yeah. So, you said something, and I, I think it'd be a good thing to kind of end on, which is people are hungry for nuance, right? And there are people out there who, yes, they're binary thinkers, but they don't know that they don't want to be binary thinkers until you introduce them to landscapes of nuance. And so instead of what I try to do, trying to convince people to think a different way, don't take my approach. Take the approach of understanding why people think the things that they think to begin with, the mechanism behind how they arrive to a certain conclusion. you can follow the same line of logic and reach a different conclusion because we're all born with different brains and different brain chemistries. And so I think that that's important to look at for people like me who've already been kind of knee deep in what I did. I had to change because I was very adversarial early on 
in my career. I was very aggressive. And now I take a different approach. I feel like I'm ch playing more chess than checkers. Mm. Early on, it, it was like music was a, a blunt force object. And then I discovered Fela. Mm. And obviously it was like, oh, it can be used as a precision tool. You know, I can, I can talk about things change within the music and have the person who's listening not even aware that I'm talking about change because I can be subtle about it. I can code it in a different way. And I even said that in one of my songs where it's like, now I speak in coded language because it's easier to slip past your defenses when I code the information differently. That's right. I love that. All right. Well, this has been amazing. Absolutely lovely. I think we've covered <laughs> some good ground, but somehow I don't even feel like we've covered half of it. So hopefully we stay in touch. I'm, yeah. part, of, I'm part of the community. So there. Well, you're welcome. I would love to have you on my podcast as well. I would love to come back and pick this conversation up whenever you'd like. Let's do it because I have way more questions. <laughs> I have way more answers. I know. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Tell everybody how they can find you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Gradensquare.com, gradensquare.net, uh, G-R-E-Y-D-O-N, squares in the shape, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I host a, um, a podcast with a good friend of mine, RK Gold. It's known as the Gray and Gold Podcast. You can check that out on Spotify, Apple Music. My music itself, you can find on Spotify, Apple Music, Bandcamp, or whatever the case may be. And um, the last thing I'll leave people with is, as far as what we do at, at Gray Unified, if you decide that you want to, to seek us out, is uh, just come willing to, to discuss things openly and be respectful, and you'll have some of the best conversations that you probably think that you want to have about these particular issues. And we talk about everything, race, politics, um, space travel, as you can see, food. We got a big active food community. So nature I, I nature i love our nature channel I, I welcome everybody who's listening to this to at least come check us out and uh get a sample as to how we communicate with each other you might you might like what we do i do thank you so much it's been amazing thank you for having me absolutely